Um, just to let you all know, um, this chapter is really, really big. Um, I've broken it up into two nights. So you will not have a test tonight. You will have a attendance code still for tonight. And then on Thursday night, we will finish up uh, chapter nine. And then we will, you'll have a test on Thursday night. I've changed the, the dates and everything going forward. So everything should be worked out. And, uh, so, uh, so we're going to move forward with patient assessment. I know Rob's going to log in a little while to kind of help out because patient assessment is, it's a, it's a lot just to let y'all know. Uh, this is a very big chapter. Uh, as we get in, we dive into the medical portion starting tonight. So tonight is kind of like, welcome to EMTs. I had to teach you a lot about the laws, the rules, kind of the history of it. Now we're kind of getting to the meat potatoes and uh, we're going to move forward into teaching you guys how to be EMTs and what to do every time you come around. Um, so let's dive off into this. Like I said, Rob will be probably in here after a while if he's not already in here. I don't know if he's in here or not, but uh, he'll, uh, he'll pipe up whenever he's here. There he is. We can talk about him and he shows up. Um, so Again, Rob may key in and say something or kind of get some attention so he can add something in here as a standard. Oh, God, he's, he's still just as ugly as I am. So <laughs> that thing's going to change, man. We are going to try to discuss this and break it down as easy as possible when we start talking about patient assessment. It's not something that we all struggle with. So don't feel like it's one of those you're like, man, I don't, I don't know what to do. I highly, highly, highly recommend reading your book after tonight we go over read your book thorough go all the way through um do start breaking out your um nremt skill sheets that's something that you can start to see the the train of things on how we're going to start pushing forward specifically about patient assessment what do you do when you walk up to somebody and how you kind of start treating them and, you know, triage. Uh, those are the things we're going to move forward with and learning on what to do. And my mouse is not going to work. Oh, and FYI, I'm actually waiting on one of the guys come off the drill floor. Uh, so when he gets here, Rob, I'll probably just turn it black and go mute so I can take care of him real quick. He has just a small issue. I'm going to get him on some medication and get him out of here. So whenever he shows up, I'll let y'all know. Motrin and water. All right. So... So your assessments, we start talking about your scene information, what patient findings we find. And I wanted you just kind to, when we talk about scene size, uh, primary, secondary assessments you see on the screen, patient history, what, why is that important to us? These are great information because when we see the scene, we start building a picture in our head, trying to figure out what happened, what type of injuries we're gonna be seeing, what is some of the mechanism of injuries? Uh, we can start predicting trauma. What, what trauma are we going to be doing? What bags do we need to take out of the truck? So your scene assessment starts when dispatch sends you to the call. That is something like, hey, you know, Unit 112, you're sent to a MVC car versus 18-wheeler. Well, your mind's going to go all over the loop. Did the truck hit the, the car or did the car hit the truck? Was it underneath? You know, all these things start building. So you know there's potential already for a very high mechanism injury. So then we're going to build into this primary assessment, secondary assessment, and what that means. Uh, we want to know about the patient's history. Now, I'm not asking to find out how long they've been on I-10, but I want to know, like, what kind of medical history do they have? Do they have history of... Um, heart attacks, diabetes, anything like that. That's the kind of history that I want that I want to know as we move forward. And then we're going to start talking about a reassessment. What, why do we reassess them? So this is where, like I said, it starts to get deep, starts to get hard. Um, I probably already dove off into this. So some of this you're probably going to see twice since I was an overachiever. So scene safety, the number one important thing for you guys is your safety, period. You are the most important person on that scene and your partner's safety is. After that, then the patient goes forward, forth from there. We never want to cause harm, which we know we've talked about that in previous chapters, 
But at the same time, as we want to try to our best to save the lives and not cause any other issues as we're trying to get out of there. So the scene management, we talk about the impact of the environment and patient care. Right now, it's the cold time of the year. So our environment could possibly be cold, hot. Uh, what is there a fire involved, hazmat? Those are the scene, like the environments that we're trying to figure out. What information do we want or what are we able to get from dispatch when we start talking about scene and environment? Now, granted, you got to understand if none of y'all have ever had the, the opportunity to dispatch, um, I highly encourage you guys to go spend some time in your dispatch centers. It's, we all get aggravated with dispatch, and I speak of this because that's how I met my wife, but we, we all talk about these, these different dispatchers and the things that they're able to tell us. And they, they only are looking at a computer screen, the same thing you're doing right now. Some of you may just be listening to us on your phone, but that's all that they can tell you is what they've been told. So even though we get frustrated and just think about, they can only give us so much. We're gonna talk about addressing the hazards. What hazards do we see? Is it fire? Is it electricity, down power line? Is it a dog? Uh, environments, things like that we need to figure out. Do we need extra help to take care of those uh, uh, scene emergencies or the scene hazards? And then violence. Violence, obviously, can it be to the patient? Is the scene violent? Do I need to have PD there? Did it become violent when, I get, when I'm there and I'm unable to... Uh... Sydney, I just got your message. Yeah, sorry. I'm having to look over there for all my other stuff. So we want to know, like, you know, do we need to hurry up and just get out of here? We're cool, but we, what are we going to do? All right, so we talked about, again, needing for additional resources or specialized uh, units, maybe like a hazmat unit. Do we need air ops? Do, what, what are all those things that we need that are specialized? Um, granted, even when you talk about law enforcement, SWAT is a specialty. That's not something that rolls out to every just domestic call that they go to. We're going to talk about standard precautions, multiple patient situations. What do we do when we're, uh, we look down and now we've got 16 patients? You're like, I don't know what to do, but we're going to move forward. So we're going to go further into that. So let's talk about primary assessment. Whew, okay. So <sighs> got to get my mind right. So on primary assessments, uh, hang on, this is my guy texting me. So. So we're going to talk about how, what do I see? How, if I'm looking, Rob's here, so I'm going to talk about it. If I look at Rob, I want to know what's wrong. I need to know, can't, is he able to uh, be alert? Is he able to breathe on his own? Can he answer questions? Basically, I want to know if he's conscious enough. Is he able to sustain life by himself? So I want to know their level of consciousness. And we're going to talk about ABCs. Does anybody remember what ABCs stand for? You ain't got to talk if you don't want to. You can type it in the group chat. I'll actually look over here and read it. If nobody wants to talk. Somebody tell me what ABCs are. You should know this. Airway, breathing, and circulation. Right on point. So we want to know their ABCs. Are they able to do that without my help? Okay. So you're gonna identify life threats because that's the first thing we wanna stop. We wanna fix that. Do they have an uncontrolled bleeding or do they have, are they, are they having agonal respirations where they're not sustaining life? And we move on for there. Uh, Andrea, you're right, you got that one. All right, so we're gonna assessment of full vital functions. I wanna know what their respirations, their pulse, their, Oxygen levels. I mean, y'all tell me what else we're talking about when we talk about vital functions. What's something else that you want to know that can help you treat this patient better? Oh, for their vital signs. Let's think about that. Um, if they got like their blood pressure, if they're allergic to anything, um, is did did something initially like just happen? Like, why are you here today? Like, what what got you here? Like, did you trip? Did you fall? Like. You really want to try to figure out every single thing because you don't know this patient. You don't have any patient history. You don't have a face sheet, an H and P or PCS form that states right. why you're dealing with this patient. So literally you're going into this blind and you try to essentially grab everything that you can grab. Yep. 
That's also right. ask them a little of about their medical history if you can. Yes. Um, and look, all y'all, if y'all look at also at the, the notes too, baby, I'm not cutting you off. But there and people are just not talking and they're saying, you know, BP heart rate, respirations, O2 sets. And, and I want to know, introduce them. Hey, my name's Chris Wally. I'm with the ambulance service. If they answer you, well, at least you know that their ABCs are working, right? So that way we're gaining some comfort with the patient, maybe. Or even if you say, hey, I'm Chris Wally from the ambulance service. Can I help you? Purple. I'm sorry. Would you? What would what, what, you say? You were looking around to figure out what is purple. Well, that's letting you know that they're not answering right questions. So that may tell you something's wrong with their knocking. And we want to try to fix these things, okay? So our general impression. Overall, and I've always said this, and I look at, bro, this dude looks like crap. We need to hurry up, okay? Well, that's my general impression. Well, maybe this dude always looks like that. I don't know. But to me... He just, he, he just don't look good. That's my general impression. So that it can improve or it can get worse. And later down the road, I can be like, hey, bro, why, why is Rob so ashy? Is, is he not perfusing good enough? Is he not, what, like, what? Then I should be able to tell. I can go back and look at my baseline set of vitals. Like we want to talk about BP heart Wait, rate. wait, wait, Chris, let me... <laughs> <laughs> you asked if Rob was so, why is he so ashy? So wait, somebody being ashy, that's a sign that something's not right? <laughs> well. Or is that a sign uh, that they didn't grab the baby oil or cocoa butter? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, Chris is the wrong word there. Um, I did. I, I'm just so used to it, I'm sorry. Chris, if you need like some jerkins or something for your hands it's cool bro I just say that. that thanks for thinking about me you, you send out an early valentine's day gifts coming up so we want to look at their like if their skin are they pale um are they you know, they clammy when you go to touch them and you're just like wow bro that's not that's not normal so we want to know what their general impression is as we move i think i'm trying not to go off on a tantrum here so i want to try to stay on things here all right, so now we're gonna start our interventions. What can we do that's small that can preserve life? Uh, integration of treatment pro procedures needed to preserve life. So this is where we start working on our life-threatening issues. What can we do to stop the blood from coming out of the body and go round and round? What can we do to keep the air moving in and out on a normal ability? These are the things that they're, they have a, you know, arterial bleed and something squirting out of their arm. We know we need to apply pressure and put on a tourniquet, high and tight. That, that's our way of fixing life threats. We're going to try to make sure we fix things and take care of them. All right. So let's break it down a little bit further. So on our history taking. So we want to know and try to understand what the chief complaint is. If they're unresponsive, we're just going to look for life threats. If their life threats are obvious, then we need to fix that. Maybe by us fixing their life threats can fix the other part of maybe why they're not able to respond. Maybe they've lost a lot of blood and their blood pressure's too low. And once we stop the bleeding and we start our chest compressions, I know we're not going to give them blood in the field, but you should be able to see signs of improvement at some point in time. We want to know the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. If they're able to tell us what's wrong, hey, Rob, tell me what's going on today. What got you to call us here today? You know, does it because you're, you know, you're out of medicines? Well, that's not a medical emergency, but that is an emergency to this patient. Uh, they want to go to the hospital because they, their stomach feels weird. Well, I understand you want to feel your stomach feels weird. How long has it been feeling weird? Those are the questions we want to ask when they tell us just what's wrong. Um, we want to talk about associated signs and symptoms. What do we see that's wrong with them or hear that's wrong with them that can particularly show what's, uh, what's refading? So if they're like, you know, I've had a history of gout. Okay, that's a reason to call 911 at 2 a.m. Sure is, but what can I do for you? So you ask these questions and you build a history of what's going on. If if they're not able to tell you, maybe you look around the scene and try to figure out what's there. Uh, Rob talks about my stomach's hurts. Well, not anymore in the last four days. 
I want to go to straight into the ER without going to the waiting room. That is correct. A lot of your patients think that using the ambulance will get you straight into the back of the hospital. No, it's not. Uh, we also have the ability to use triage and place you in the waiting room. And much times that these that we see these days is our ERs are overrun. People use them as general practice, like their GP, which is their general physician. And you should be going to a doctor's office or uh, we call them walking clinics or, you know, the little stop and get a prescription clinic, whatever you want to call it. That's where people should be going versus these ERs. All right, so we want to investigate their chief complaint. When I ask, when Rob says my stomach hurts, that gives me an opportunity to start asking a lot more questions because you called me. I didn't call to come see you at two o'clock in the morning. You know, when's the last time you ate? Uh, when's the last time you had a bowel movement? Do you have history of any kind of GI problems? Um, past medical history, do you have any hypertension, high sugar, low sugar? Do you have any cardiac in your ticker? And they don't understand when you're like, do you have any cardiac problems? Be like, does your heart have any issues when it beats? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got AFib. Well, that's important. Maybe we should have let off with that in the beginning. And then pertinent negatives. We're going to explain things further, but these are parts, these are, these are bullets when we want to talk about history taking. What do we want to get out of them when we start asking questions to help us build a better uh, initial impression, a better history on the patient. Um, those are just semi-normal questions. So when we start our uh, secondary assessment, this is gonna be more detailed. Um, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm off on the left field. So our secondary assessments, we're gonna do a full head to toe, quick assessment. I wanna know and I, when I say put hands on it from the head to the toe, let me say what I'm trying to mean. So when I say it later on, you understand. I want to be able to make sure that when I touch them and I'm supposed to be touching in the most educational medical way that I'm looking for any type of deformities, bleeds, anything that's gonna draw my attention to that area that I may not be able to see by them having a, a long sleeve shirt on or a jacket on, those things could be hidden. So I wanna be able to touch their extremities. I wanna run my hand down it, make sure it's there. When you palpate, let's say I'm trying to do an assessment on uh, a female. I have to be very cautious about what I do as in when I palpate the chest because I'm not examining their breast, I'm examining their chest, their respirations. Do they have trouble when they breathe and it's coming from the side of the ribs? So you have to be cautious about that. And the same thing versus for women, you, you don't do a, you know, a pelvic griddle. When you check their hip, make sure they slip, tripped, and fell. You're not trying to check the femoral artery. It's just some of those things that you, you just have to be careful of. Um, assessment of vital signs. I'm oh, sorry. Assessment of the pain. I want to know, is it sharp, dull? Does it radiate anywhere? Does it have anything that's going to cause me any issues uh, as we move down the road? There we go. Hang on. All right. So, somebody else. I'm trying to you can go. Somebody's mic is on. I don't know if y'all can hear that or not. The ability to mute whoever's mic that is. But anyway, um, so I want to know, and you know, when you go to the doctor, you have like the smile chart, you know, the good smile all the way to the frown. That's what I'm looking for. Zero to 10, 10 being the worst pain you felt in your life. And I'm going to straight up say it. When you would do this to a man, their pain scale is a lot really hard, higher than, yes, uh, the Wong Baker scale. Is that right in that, Keo? I think that's right. Isn't that what you're referring to? Yeah. I, as soon as I saw it, I knew exactly what you were saying. So, and that's also some good bit of information. That's also known the Wong Baker is the smiley faces. So that's their pain scale. Men, we have a tendency to make things hurt a little bit more than they really say, or we just judge them high because our pain tendencies are a little bit 
lower than what they probably should be. And we kind of say, that's the worst pain in my life. Ladies, when they say, is it worse than giving childbirth? And they're like, nope, nothing like it. Take it for granted if they've had children before. If they're like, nope, this is a four. My legs cut off, but that's only a pain scale of four. Buddy, I'm writing down a four. I ain't arguing. Men, we're going to say, that's a 26. I don't know where the neighbor come from, but we'll take, you know, pain patient says out of a 10. I need to know the, the quality of it. Does it radiate anywhere? Those are the things I'm asking when I want to know about their, their uh, assessment of pain. We're going to do another assessment of their vital signs. We're going to check them again. We want to check your vital signs on non-stable patients every five minutes. So if they're critical, we want to check it every five minutes. If they are stable, like you and I are sitting right here, we do it every 10 to 15 minutes. Um, our machine out here is set to every 10 minutes unless I automatically set it. Um, techniques of physical examination. I wanna know their respiratory system. Are they breathing in and out on their own? Do they need supplemental oxygen? And do they have breath sounds on the left and the right? Now, obviously you're gonna have to use your stethoscope to make sure of that, not just because they're like, yep, he's over there sitting in the rocking chair breathing. Perfect, I got that, because he's talking to us. But I wanna, I wanna know what the, the, the breath sounds sound like. Do I make sure that they're moving air in and out like they're supposed to? And what rate are they breathing at? Why is that important? Because it, it, it's, it is. It, it's important because we can go into respiratory failure when we don't start oxygenating very well. That's our problem. That's our number one problem. I'm addicted to breathing. I told you all that before. All right, so techniques for physical examination. We wanna talk about their cardiovascular system. Check for a pulse. You can listen to the heart rate with their, and their heart tones with your stethoscope. We wanna check your neurologic system, your musculoskeletal system, and all anatomic regions. So when I check your neurologic, ask simple questions. Hey, sir, who, what is today? The answer, I have to look because I really don't even know what day it is because I'm supposed to go home today. That's how I should know it's Tuesday. So if they answer simple questions and you want to use something that everybody should know, uh, like who's the president, uh, what year it is, what month it is, those are simple questions that we should all know. Now, even though I do COVID testing every single day, my sheets of paper have everybody listed out on it and the top of it says the date. I half the time don't even know what today's date is. Just, I check my watch like 70 times a day just for the, the date. But those simple questions we ask to check their neurologic system is just something we should all know. Their musculoskeletal system, can they, can they reach out and grab? When you say, hey, squeeze my finger, squeeze them as tight as you can get them, we're checking their muscular system. Those are some of the things that we wanna know uh, do they have good equal grip? Do they have good equal push or pull? Because we're also checking that to see if we need to go down the lane of a stroke. So let's, if that's the case, we can take it down the stroke lane. And the anatomic regions is things where they're supposed to be. Um, are things missing? Or, you know, was that called, rate of the cause because it was a traumatic injury? We, we just need to make sure things are where they're supposed to be when it's, we talk about and some of the anatomic regions. All right, so here's some of our devices that help us as we go to work on things, check on the patients that we don't have to sit there and be like, are they doing it? Are they? It's, it helps us. It's a, I hate the word tool for your tool bag because a lot of people have a lot of tools in their tool bag and they always forget them. These are just tools of the job. How about that? So there are these two devices, the pulse ox and the blood pressure, non-invasive blood pressure, is... The pulse ox is always going to rest the little thing they put on your finger when you get your blood pressure and it checks your and it checks your pulse. It also tells us how much oxygen you're breathing in and out. Now, while we're talking about that, let's state if a young lady or elderly lady or just a lady in general has their fingernails painted and they are fake nails, you don't really you don't get a very good uh, pulse ox. Um, if it is a fake nail, I mean if it's a real nail, you're supposed to be able to take the uh, nail polish off and then put it on there. 
but some ladies are probably going to get upset about that. So be cautious on that route. A lot of companies now have the alternate tool to where you can put the little uh, Band-Aid on their finger with the red light like you see in the hospitals. Um, you can put those on the, on the earlobe or, you know, across the forehead. Those will still give you the same readings. Um, it, it just depends on what I have and how long I have to do something. So your non-invasive blood pressures, those are the ones that we either take manually or we put it on the, uh, the monitor and the monitor takes itself. And those, like I said, the one I have here is set for every 10 minutes. It automatically goes off. I don't have to do it. It keeps a record of it. it. Keeps a record of everything from the time I turn it on to the time I turn it off. If I turn it off and don't get my, my summary, I'm going to hate life because now I have to go back into the history and pull it up. So, I mean, I know we're only 11 slides in. Do y'all have any questions real quick? Hey, Rob, I'm going to have to step away in just about four minutes when he gets up here. That's fine. If you want to just put him on a break, I'm about to have to I'm gonna be tied up for a few minutes as well. Yeah. So i tell you what, uh, introduction, we're going to do over patient assessments. Uh, we're going to talk about the assessment process. Patient assessment is used to do some degree in uh, every single patient we encounter. 110% correct. I'm always going to be asking the same set of questions every single time. Uh, Tell you what, let's do that. Let's take 10 minutes. Uh, see you back here. Let's say it's 6.30. See you back here at 6.40. So we'll see y'all in just a few minutes. Sorry about this, y'all.
All right, so let's try this again. Uh, Gabriella, did you happen to get this? You got what you needed off that before I go forward? All right. Maybe it helped if I hit the right button. All right, so now we're going to start into our introduction. We talked about that patient assessment, something that we do every single time that we're going to come in part with a, a patient. We're going to say this. We're going to ask the same. I mean, I have a routine of questions I ask on a normal basis, even when the patient comes to me out here versus when I'm on the ambulance. So I ask the same, kind of the same questions to get me moving forward. All right. So we do have five main parts of our scene assessments or, or our primary. In, sorry, brain's going all over the place tonight. We're going to do over scene size up, primary assessment, history taken secondary assessment and reassessment. The order in which these steps are performed depends on the patient's condition and the environment. If it's something like I may be able to do our primary assessment, uh, but I'm not gonna be able to do our history taking or reassessment due to maybe weather, uh, the traumatic patient, I may just be doing that as we're moving down the, down the road or towards the hospital. It may be necessary to change the order of some of these steps uh, after the scene size up, based on what you find to prioritize and uh, to move forward depending on the circumstances. Um, if it's more important for me to, to figure out why that, maybe I need to know that they are allergic to, uh, to bee stings, that's important. Maybe I need to ask those questions as I'm during my, uh, my initial assessment, I can put them together. Your primary assessment, and your history taking can literally go hand in hand because you're really gonna be asking questions as you move through. But let these people know what you're doing. Don't just walk up and be like, hey, my name's Wally, I'm here to take care of you. And you start touching on them. I'm gonna be like, bro, what, what you doing? Get your hands off of me. So let the people know, be like, hey, listen, as I'm talking to you, I'm just gonna be kind of making sure that you, I can feel your extremities. I'm gonna work my way down to your feet and I'm gonna try to get you to, to push and pull on against my hands. It just lets people more comfortable as we move forward and not just like, what is this weirdo doing touching me? Like, well, I don't know him. Um, so rarely does a one sign or symptom uh, show you the patient status or underlying problem. You gotta kind of dig for this. You gotta kind of figure out what's, what's going on. Uh, a symptom is a subject, uh, subjective condition that the patient feels and tells you about. They may not tell you what is exactly their symptom is or their chief complaint, because when you get to the hospital, it's going to be completely different. And you're like, you, you didn't tell me that your leg's been hurting this for a while. You, you, don't, you don't tell me that. Um, a sign is an objective condition that you observe or measure about the patient. I would recommend knowing this. Don't memorize it, but I would know the difference in them. Um, so signs and symptoms go hand in hand. Um, you can have a symptom of something and not show a sign of it. You can have a sign and no symptoms. Like, for example, like COVID, you can be positive, but have no symptoms. Or you can have signs and saying, you know, like, bro, that kind of sounds like you have COVID. So you, you can, they can be split up. Uh, Rob says, the different, know the difference between signs and symptoms. I'm pretty sure there's going to be a test question. Um, if not, it will definitely be a registry question. Uh, that's something that I would write down. I know some of y'all probably write this down. So uh, if some of y'all want to write this down and then tell me I can move forward, please let me know and I will be happy to. Uh, I'll kind of pause for a minute. Uh, Rob says, what's the sign of a heart attack? You'll get three symptoms and a sign and all four apply to heart attack. So all four look right. <laughs> they, they play mind games. Uh, that, that, that's, and it's asking you to answer the most correct answer. All right, so scene size up. Your scene size up refers to your evaluation of the conditions in which you'll be operating. And like I said, they start from dispatch. It's you look at a scene, you're like, just looks like a 
brick and mortar house, brick and, brick and mortar house. Uh, I mean, we're just normal residential house. Let's go. So scene size up continues to go through the entire scene until you're back in the your ambulance where it's your comfort zone. Always have situation awareness. Uh, situation awareness is necessary throughout the entire call to ensure safety. Um, dispatch provides your very basic information. Majority of it is address, chief complaint, and they tell you to go lights or sirens, lights or no sirens, lights and sirens or not. It just cut they they queued uh, MD the call and it meets a level of uh, responsiveness of what they need to do. Uh, scene size up combines information and observations to help you ensure safe and effective operations and understanding the situation and conditions prior to responding, like the dispatcher's information and his observation of the scene. Uh, a lot of times you'll get calls and be like multiple 911 calls from this area about this MVC. Uh, we're going to go ahead and roll you another unit that way. Uh, if you don't need them, you can cancel them. Um, it, it's just things like that kind of tell you, be like, oh, this is probably going to be a messed up call. Great. 10 minutes where I get off of work. Never happens that way. It's always you get off on time. You never get off on time. Um, if at any point in time that you notice the scene has become dangerous, just leave. Uh, just have a, a kind of a keyword. Be like, hey, Rob, can you help me go get the, uh, the, the blue mattress? We need to put them because he needs to be padded in the back. And that may be just a keyword that you two have if you work on a truck together that, that it's time to leave all your equipment there and just leave because it's not safe. Um, Anytime you have, now this one right here is important where it says hazmat. Hazmat scenes always, always park uphill, upwind. Because it won't roll up the hill and winds don't normally come up. Uh, the, the wind doesn't come back at you. So you want the wind blowing past you down towards the scene. Park uphill, upwind. That's what you want to do to maintain the most and safest hazmat scene for your response. Um, if you know it's a, a particular hazmat scene, um, do your best to look at it through binoculars, look at it from a distance and try to your best not to get up close. If you realize that once you're there, it's a hazmat scene, you need to back out because that is an unsafe area for you. Um, issues you, you may encounter in the pre-hospital setting can range from minor difficulties to major things. I, I mean, I can't tell you one thing that you will or won't see because every one of them are dangerous. Uh, they all have their particular dangers. Um, MVCs on the highway, well, obviously the idiots that aren't paying attention is dangerous to you. Um, domestic violence is that you're not aware of and you're in there trying to treat a patient that just got beat up and you don't know why. And then whomever the aggressor is comes in and potentially starts shooting or stabbing. The, those things I can't tell you when it comes to, but it, if your spider senses go off and you just get that butterflies in your stomach, listen to them. It, it's, you're not Superman and you're not bulletproof, so just leave if you need to. If a scene is not safe for you and your team to enter the scene, approach and manage the patient. Do, do what you can to make it safe for all and call for additional help. Again, if if it means that you leave the patient there and you leave, that, that's okay because it was not safe for you and you did the safest thing that you could do to get away. You can't help somebody if you're also hurt. Consider traffic safety issues and issues related to scene safety. Um, if you approach a patient on the wrong, uh, on a working roadway, um, always, always, always wear your vest. Uh, I know some fire departments require either bunker pants and a helmet with a vest or helmet, jacket and vest. It, it, I've seen it all different ways. Some departments require you to be in 100% turnout gear anytime you respond to a working roadway. Um, it Just make sure you listen to whatever your company's policies and procedures are and follow those. Um, consider environmental conditions at the scene. I, Never been on one of these, don't want to go on one of those, but that's what those specialties, uh, those like 
snow medics and you know off the grid medics they have they have them there for particular reasons because that is a that's a specialty and these guys go to particular schools to learn different types uh, like uh, remote medicine they, they teach you some of those things like that um, how you park where you park um, is very vital again you should have that training when you go through your company's hiring process, um, firefighters will go through a basically like a driving course. Uh, driving school teaches you how to pump the truck and how to maneuver the truck. They teach you some of those things, um, but shield using your vehicle to shield you and your partner um, in case of an accident, they may hit your the ambulance first. Those are particularly important. Uh, scene control, tell crowds to step back, introduce your Introduce your sled to patients and always ask for consent to treat. Not real sure what sled is, but I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be self. So we'll uh, have to take a note of that and then introduce your sled. Um, but just being, let them know first name basis. Those are kind of neat to have. Don't use baby sugar, honey. Those can be offensive. Um, and not knowing your uh the patient's background, not knowing what's going on, could be very offensive and uh, could not turn out good for you in the beginning. So that's the reason why it's always good. Be like, hey man, my name's Wally, what's up, man? I, I'm a paramedic on the ambulance. Can I help you? Uh, can you tell me what's going on? Do you care if I treat you? Simple questions like that, um, asking simple questions that people pick up and understand and that you're not over trying to over talk them. That, that's very important. Talking slow, calm, relaxed. Uh, when you start being nervous and, and, and like, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on, all. Those are start causing issues. Uh, sir and ma'am are offensive in the New York, I've learned. So I, Rob can speak about that. I'm not from the North. I've been up there one time uh, and I have noticed that. Um, I don't consider the, the Northerners rude. I consider them extremely busy. Um, but again, knowing your Knowing your knowing your environment and where you're at and your surroundings, which will help you when you talk to the public. Um, sometimes you can speak with high medical terms and sometimes you just be like, hey, bro, you got low sugar or high sugar? They know exactly what you're talking about. It doesn't matter. Uh, trying to communicate with your patient. We have a lot of Hispanics out here. I don't speak a bit of Spanish. I, I hate it. I've picked up a little bit as I've worked with these guys out here. So I bring in somebody that speaks their language and, and speaks very good English and it makes them feel comfortable. Uh, it, may, it helps them out. So just uh, common dialect will be very helpful. And if you're appropriate, help protect bystanders from becoming a patient as well. Tell them, hey, back up, be careful, get out of the roadway, don't park over there. Uh, we have some forms of hazard. We talk about environmental. We have physical, which includes sharp metal, broken glass, slip trips and falls. Uh, we talk about chemical, which is a hazmat. We want to talk about electrical, which we we know we all have storms. Um, some more than the others. Uh, the coastal areas may have the hurricane issues. Um, I've dealt with a lot more tornadoes than I have hurricanes. But being out here in the Gulf, we're we already, we've already started implementing our hurricane season uh, protocols just because it takes a lot of movement and planning to get ours up and going. You got to think the only way to transport out here is by air and it takes to get everybody off of here. It takes eight helicopters on a normal day. So you just, and then we're not the only platform out here. So it takes a lot of planning. Um, explosions, fire, uh, physical violence, so those are some of the, the hazards that we, we're gonna be exposed to. Um, no matter what type of call we go to, just a routine call, pick up from the hospital, we still can potentially come across all those hazards. Be aware of scenes that have potential for violence. Uh, it doesn't matter where either, we're gonna, we can have these too. So you have violent patients, distraught family members, angry bystanders, uh, unruly crowds, uh, an emergency scene is dramatically changing environment. Man, they change, the, the scene can adapt and change. The fire department gets there, puts lights on it. Now you can see the hazard that you just walked through. It could be ant beds. 
that you're highly allergic to. Um, and just not being able to know what's there. So being very scene safety and, and alert to these things will help you out dramatically. Determining the mechanism. Now you need to know these terms. So I would know these abbreviations. Hint, hint, hint. The mechanism of injury or the MOI or the nature of illness, which is the NOI. Those are the two that you're gonna hear right throughout the rest of the program. That we're gonna know, I am more used to saying what is the mechanism of injury, um, just cause I'm a little older school. The nature of illness, I, I just, I don't use it as much as I should and I need to adapt into that. So calls for assistance to which you may respond can be categorized as medical conditions, traumatic injuries, uh, you can have both of them. You can have a medical injury that caused the traumatic injury. Um, traumatic injuries are the results of physical force applied to the outside of the body, usually from an object striking the body or the body striking an object. Um, so just uh, knowing the difference will help you move on. Uh, where it says on your screen, mechanism of injury is majority for trauma patients. The nature of illness is used for medical patients. Um, and and I will, I'll agree to that. I've used them both, both types of calls. Oh. Here comes the yawning, sorry. Um, the index of suspension is suspicion is your, is your own judgment. Nobody can tell you that you're wrong because that's your personal judgment of whether how severely the patient is injured or not. If you, uh, if you say this is a traumatic scene, then you're going to treat them in a traumatic process. Uh, there are different types of processes. We can have a medical patient and we can have a traumatic patient, and we're going to speed things up a little bit faster when it comes to that traumatic call, because we want to get them to the uh, highest level of care the fastest that we can. So you can use them both. That's just what I want to kind of break it down to y'all. Don't know why that's there. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, so high index of suspicion for patient trauma. So we talk about falls, crashes, collisions, explosions, violence, burns. I put that in there because that is kind of important um, about the um, just those little things like a fall can create a, uh, a bad hip fracture. Uh, they can lose a lot of blood inside the abdomen and the pelvic and the pelvic griddle. So we, we have to think about um, the MOI, nature of illness, and all that when it comes to any of these. So explosions, let's think about that. So we have the initial blast, you have the uh, tertiary blast, you have um, flying objects, you have all these different things that you need to consider uh, when we talk about explosions. Uh, when it comes down to burns, so on burns, do we have something that's on them that's going to continue to burn them? Um, we need to stop the burn, remove the burn, and, and, and cool the patient off. So those are all mechanisms, injuries, and nature of illnesses that we need to address and fix right then. That's a life-threatening illness. Injury, sorry. So blunt trauma. For patients who have experienced traumatic injuries, determine the mechanism of injury. Terms commonly associated with the MOI include blunt trauma and penetrating trauma. So blunt trauma is the force occurs over a broad area. We don't really necessarily break the skin. Um, it's like me hitting you with a baseball bat. That's a blunt injury, a blunt trauma injury. Um, so you do have tissues and hollow organs in the area that impact by the damage. Um, it's, so if I hit you with a bat in the stomach, that's a broad area that I'm gonna hit. Um, I'm, not, I'm not isolating it to a very small where I may have a lot more uh, precise injury. Um, it's gonna be over the span of my abdomen. So penetrating, obviously we know what that do. Uh, penetrating is what's gonna break the skin. For patients who have experienced traumatic injuries, determine the mechanism of injury, the MOI. Terms commonly associated with MOI include bunt and trauma, trauma injuries. Um, open wound or high potential for infection. Um, if you get stabbed, that is a penetrating object. Um, something gets, let's say, a piece of rebar. You slip, trip, and fall and land on rebar, one that they holds concrete, and it's there. 
you don't want to remove it because you may you don't know where it's at it maybe controlling the blood on the inside so we need to try to figure out how to move the patient to the facility to the medical facility so blunt trauma is a penetrating or sorry penetrating trauma is something that penetrates the body cavity the the cheek the eyes that you know anywhere that is a potentially can uh, break the skin for medical patients, determine the NOI, which we know that's the nature of illness. The, there are very some, there are similar, similar, the MOI and the NOI are very common. Talk with the patient. Just talking can give you some ideas and give you an understanding of what's going on with this patient. Uh, maybe it's something that has been going on for a while. And it's just something that's flared up. Uh, use your scenes to check for clues. Um, diabetics, I've told you, check sometimes check the refrigerator. Um, it's check what potentially in their pockets. Um, it just kind of things telling you ideas that what's going on. Does you know is the patient confined to the recliner in the living room? Well, everything that they're going to need is going to be surrounding them, and that's going to kind of be their lifestyle. Is going to be sitting right there. Um, are they heavy smokers? That could potentially tell you a nature of illness um, that they may not be able to uh, breathe very good because of them being a smoker for 40 years. Um, just reading the signs that are in the immediate area is something that's also going to be important. Sorry, I'm trying to get comfortable here. Be aware of scenes with multiple patients who are exhibiting the similar signs and symptoms because that should tell you possibly of what's going on. Like on yours, it's showing you example of carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, could indicate an unsafe scene for a patient. You're gonna have the puffy red skin, the... Maybe they're passed out, maybe they're unresponsive. You'll The puffy red skin is kind of one of the biggest things that I've seen when I go to carbon monoxide and I've gone to three of those that I can remember in my career. All of them had like the cherry red cheeks that were swole, kind of look like Santa Claus, but the wrong time of year. Uh, just that weird, like smell that like, ooh, what's, 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 what's that? Um, so trying to figure those out can kind of, you know, tell you why you need to be aware of the scene. Uh, what's the importance of the NOI and MOI? Well, considering that the NOI and M MOI can be uh, early can be of value in preparing for your patients, uh, caring for them. So it can tell you on what possibly you need to fix, what we need to work on. Um, like, uh, oh, never mind. Um, I was going to show you a picture, but look at so look at this picture. So when I walk up to the scene, we don't know what this guy is on the ground for, but we know that it's our time to shine and take care of them. If I'm not mistaken, the ambulance says Baltimore. Everybody be on your considerations. That's uh, you know, Baltimore just lost three of their firefighters. So that's, that's kind of rough. Uh, so, but again, I, I want to know what this guy's mechanism of injury. When I walk up to him, if y'all can see, he's already reaching and grabbing his shoulder. Okay, so that may be telling me, you know, shoulder problems. Was he hit by something? Was he hit by a car? All this wants to start running through the back of my head on what's going on and we'll, like, what do we do now? How are we going to treat him? Are we going to treat him as a medical patient or a traumatic patient? That's just something that we need to try to figure out as we're walking up to them. So in the picture, we're going to talk about standard uh, precautions. So PPE, personal protective equipment. That is probably one of the biggest things you will use throughout this entire career. And in all of your NREMT checkoff skills, you have to verbalize, uh, I have my PPE on. You can either have it on or you verbalize saying uh, eye protection, gloves, and a mask. It, it depends on, when, like when you come to boot camp, they'll, they'll lead you a little bit more so you kind of understand like face-to-face -face what we're talking about here. But standard precautions is you start with PPE. Um, hopefully you guys have looked at those, uh, standard, those skill checkoff sheets. 
because that's what you're going to be graded on. Um, and when it says BSI scene safe, you are looking for BSI's body, body substance isolation. You're looking for objects, blood, bodily fluids, and other potential exposures. So that's what your standard precautions are recommended to deal with. I want to have my BSI scene safe. I'm asking you when I look BSI scene safe, I'm holding my hands up, showing my instructor, the gloves are on, the mask is on, and the eye protection. Like here, prime example, these, my glasses can be eye protection. You don't have to wear like the chemistry goggles. That's something that you just, and they start fogging up and you're like, ah, I see you. There you are. Okay, hold right on. Oh, there you are. Just having some standard eye protection on, on every call is very, very important. Um, I have a set of sunglasses that are grayed. Uh, they're kind of a gray. You can see them. They're mirrored a little bit. You can still see my eyes, but I wear them on every call I go on. I despise having your blood on me. That is something that I'm just like, well, I can't, I can't handle it. I got to get it off of me. So that's why I wear the, the goggles. Um, I wore them even when I was in the Middle East working on patients. Uh, I've been through multiple glasses, but I, I do that every time. Um, here, so the concept of standard precautions assumes that all bodily, uh, all blood, bodily fluids, obviously except sweat, uh, not they do not come in contact with the skin and mucous membrane that may pose a substantial risk of infection. I want you to keep your cooties and me to keep my cooties. That's the point of us using BSI scene safe. When you step out of the EMS rig and before actual patient contact, have all of your PPE on. At a minimum, you can only have gloves uh, and, well, at a minimum is gloves. That's the lowest that you can go down. You should always touch the patients with gloves on. Nowadays, you need to consider wearing a HEPA mask or an N95, a gown. Not really sure what they're referring to a helmet. They're meaning like, Structural fire helmet, like a collapse helmet. Eh, we'll leave that open though. So, but at a minimum, always come in contact with gloves. I like eye protection. Um, that's a personal thing. Um, so, but you you can build your own personal items that you would like too. Oh. During the scene size up, it is important to accurately identify the total numbers of patients. You need to get a count on how many bodies that lie in front of you. When there are multiple patients, you should use the incident command system, identify the number of patients, and begin triage. If you know, oh, I don't know if we talk about triage in this chapter or not, but if you don't know what triage is, I'm looking for that the triage comes in different colors. You have green, yellow, red, and black. Um, so green is obviously good. Yellow is like, oh, they're hurt, but they can still wait. Red is meaning either they're, they're, in, they're in a very critical situation. We need to do something to take care of them. Um, and black is mean they've been deceased or they're in the process of dying no matter what I did. Uh, I have unfortunately had to do this on a large scale and I've had to tag people black and move forward knowing that they were uh, blinking at me or they had they took their last breath. I've, I've seen that. It was very hard for me the first time that I've had to do it. Had to do it on multiple occasions now. Um, it's just something that it's never comes easy, but you just learn how to deal with it. Um, but being the chain of command and you're the incident commander, you're having to make these steps, you're having to make these situations and these calls. Uh, and proceed. The longer you take, triage should take about 10 to 15 seconds per patient to move forward. Anytime that you put your hands on a patient and you try to save their life, you potentially are losing another life because now you're doing, you're providing care to this patient. Once you start care, you cannot abandon the patient or that is abandonment and you can go to jail for that. Um, when it talks about a calling for backup, backup can be at this point anybody that will show up. So we will call for additional EMS units, law enforcement, 
the fire department and other air operations if you're on an air crew. Those are all your sources of backup. Um, additional EMS units could potentially also be another service provider um, that you may have a, a MOU with, which is a member, memorandum of understanding, to where if there's a situation that y'all can reach out and help each other. Normally, you wouldn't cross lines unless something happened that was dramatic and you're, you're all your, uh, your resources were taxed. Um, triage is the process of sorting patients. So as we did talk about here. Um, we talked about that. Some situations may require more ambulances or specialized uh, resources. That right there is not, and I don't know anybody's level of training, but in this course, what you see them wearing those level A suits is not in any one of your policies or procedures right now. That is not your scope of practice. If you are a hazmat technician, that is understandably perfect, fine, but that's not your job duty while we're in this program. Um, so, but it may require a additional resources that these guys in the level A suits have got to go pull your victims out of an area, they get washed and triaged, and then they come to you. Uh, this could be a complex scene uh, that requires multiple resources. Specialized resources include your paramedic units, which is an ALS. You have your air medical support. Then you have fire department may handle hazard materials management, technical rescue services, technical rescue. <coughs> Technical rescue can, uh, can mean above grade or below grade. They can come from a roof down or go in uh, underground. You have your high angle rope rescues and considered water rescue. And then you have your law enforcement. Some areas that I've worked with before, um, the police officer is also the firefighter that's on duty for the local department and they're cross-trained where you're like, at, at what level do you just, stop and do something. Um, even when I was a, a sheriff's department, um, I had to, I could still treat the patients, but I had to make sure the scene was safe and it was under control before I could move to a different type of role. I can't just go as a deputy into the medical scene and not make sure I could just be one tracked and then I can end up being uh, ang uh, you know, injured in some other way if, I'm, if I don't go in law enforcement mode first. Questions to ask determine the need for additional resources. Does the scene pose a threat to you or the patient or others? Well, who are you gonna ask? Because dispatch, we're not gonna call the Ghostbusters. Sorry, that's kind of hitting my brain. Who are you gonna call? Um, does the scene pose a threat? Well, all of them potentially can cause a threat to you, your patient and others. Well, they're like, and the dispatch may tell you, at this time, we're unaware. How many patients are there? Why, why do you need to know that? It's just you and your partner. If there's 15 patients, you can't treat them. You need to start triage as the other amateurs are coming. And then you can start telling them, hey, I have six reds. I have four yellows, 17 greens, and eight blacks. Everybody knows at that point you're going to just be, and you get that one, you get that one. It's going to be a service and a system that works. And do we have additional resources in the area that can respond? I, I mean, I, I need to know because I'm not personally having to keep up with all that, but somebody in dispatch is gonna have to keep up for that. And they're the ones that's gonna help relay, relay that information. All right, Whew. okay. So primary assessment. The primary assessment begins when you reach your patient. Uh, I wanna take that a step back is, your primary assessment should start when you're walking towards that patient and you start building up a initial assessment or your overall outlook. How does this patient look to you? Your general impression starts when you start to see them. So now we start building a primary assessment. The single all important goal of the primary assessment is to identify and begin treatment of immediate life threats. If there's uh, an arterial bleed or their extremity is missing, I need to stop that and put a tourniquet on it to save a life. If I don't do that, they will pass away. Okay, I need to fix that. That's a life threat. If they're not breathing, 
I need to start CPR. If I don't do that, we, we, we're going to pronounce them in a minute, but I need to do something. You must physically examine the patient and assess the level of consciousness, which is written as LOC, and their ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. Those are the things that I must notice and I assess their quality. Forms a general impression. Uh, you wanna form this to determine the priority of care and is your first part of your primary assessment. This includes age, sex, race, level of distress, and their overall appearance. What, what do they look like to me? Do they look good? Do they look bad? I, I just need to know because I, I, I gotta figure out how to treat them and take care of them. The age, sex, race, and level of distress, that is something that's going to be determined. You have to get that information for your report. So you might as well walk it, write it down. Like myself, on my glove, I would write patient's name. So no matter what, when I look at my hand, I can see what the patient's name is and I can call them by their name. And I will write 41 year old, 41 slash W slash M. So it'd be 41 year old white male. That way I know, or I have their driver's license and I clip it on my pen. That way at the same time as I understand, this is the patient that I'm taking care of. Same thing for multiple patients. I can do the same thing. Patient one, you can divide it. My handwriting sucks, so I can't really, I don't ever write on the palms of my hand because it eventually will wear off or it could get covered in blood. Uh, Cell phones have been great for us because if you get to a certain point, you can take this dirty glove off, take a picture of it and put your phone back to the side. That way that when I do get rid of my left glove, that patient information is not gone. Um, I try to always double glove. And the reason why I do that is to where when my gloves do get dirty and it's time for me to take them off, your hands are already sweaty. I, I'm not gonna be trying to put on a dry glove with a wet hand. It's like trying to put on wet paint or dry pants with wet legs. It's just not gonna work. It, it takes a hot minute to do that. Note the patient's position and whether the patient is moving or are they still. Why is that important to me? Uh, stand by for one second. Sounds good, Rob. He's messaged me on the side and I'm just, I get out of, I get out of control and out of mind here. All right, so notice the patient's position because wh why is that important? I need to note that way I found them in my report. So that's why I wanna know what position they're in. Avoid standing over the patient if possible because that is a very uh, demeaning position. I, I don't want to look down on the patient. I want to try the best that patient to look eye to eye to me. And that's a respect thing. If I, like I'm trying to look at you right now through the camera, as you can't you tell, I'm always making eye contact. <laughs> but I, I want to be able to see them eye to eye and work from there. Introduce yourself to the patient, first name or last name. I, like I've told y'all before, I always go by Wally. Hey man, my name's Wally, I'm with the ambulance service. How are you tonight? If they respond, now I've already assessed their ABCs. I already told you that. Ask about the chief complaint. Why am I here today? Unfortunately, if you know them, be like, hey, Mr. Smith, it's good to see you again. What brought us this time? And it could be a chronic patient that has multiple issues and they're not being attacked on the services. They just have multiple issues. Uh, let's see, the patient's response can give you insight to the, the LOC their air patency, respiratory status, and overall circulation. So I got to have air to talk. I got to have respirations to, to beat right here. And my overall circulatory status, if I'm able to answer you, that lets you know that air is moving through and blood is going round and round. So those are positives. Life-threatening problems should be treated immediately, which we know, we, we know that that's time that I need to stop the blood, need to possibly put a tourniquet on there, 
Maybe I had to apply the Brett pressure until I can get the tourniquet ready. Those are important. Determine whether your patient's condition is stable, but is potentially unstable or unstable to direct further assessment and treatment. So do, can I, if they're unstable, which means they're critical, I need to figure out what's wrong and I need to fix it. If I don't do something right now, that patient's going to pass. Well, that's not what I want. I want this patient to check out of the hospital is what I want. So I need to know if they're stable enough that I can, what we call it, as you'll hear us after a while, Rob will mention it too. If they're stable means I can stay in play, which means I can stay on scene and do my skills. If they're unstable, we need to transport. That's it. Don't stay in play on unstable patients. Only stay in play on stable patients. So I want y'all to know that there's the, I keep saying it, stable and unstable are the two classifications of patients we're gonna have. Do y'all have any questions on that right there? Looking at the chat just to make sure I'm not missing anything. All right, Mary speaking for y'all. Come on now, has anybody else got anything? Yes, does history have a part in that? Now, HX means history. Is that what you're referring to? All right, so yes, at that point, my, well, are you talking about for my general impression or as I'm going through there? Okay, Rob's, Rob's rocking on there. So if the patient has a cardiac history, but EKG is fine, a symptom steady result. You don't have, okay, so Rob, you're, you're right. I, I get where you're going. Uh, and that's a very good question. Um, but we're building into that. So we're, we're barely scratching the surface of patient assessment. So we're still at trying to put our clothes on for the day. We ain't got our, even our belt on yet. We're just trying to get the break, the, we're breaking the surface. So, you know, did that answer your question there? I mean, I, I promised you, when we get moving further, we're going to talk about history. You're going to be like, ah, there it is. It's coming. All right. Thank you for asking. That was a good question. Though. All right. So, I determine whether your patient's condition is stable, stable but potentially unstable, or unstable to direct further assessment and treatment. So, those are you. Those are the three overall general impressions. Um, stable is all of us sitting right here. We're all stable. Um, stable but potentially unstable means, uh, you know, if we don't, we don't give this guy some oxygen, he's going to end up crashing and he's going to be pretty, you know, he could be. So I'm going to rule him kind of stable but unstable. We need to keep an eye on him. So if this patient's in the back of the ambulance, here's why, here's the way I, where I give them their stabilizations. If they're stable, man, we're going to hit every red light in town. If they're stable, but potentially unstable, we're going to get on the interstate. We ain't going to waste no time, but we're not going to go lights and sirens. If they're unstable, we're going to let everybody in the surrounding area know that we're coming because we're going to be running lights and sirens and we're going to be headed to the hospital pretty quick, but in a safe manner. Okay, um, that's that's our point is to get there in a very safe manner. Uh, hang on, let me go back over Rob's question again because um, y'all, hang on one second. I want to look real quick. Um, hey, Rob, uh, real quick, how far do you want to go? Because I plan on stopping at like chapter uh, slide 60 something. Uh, later on, we get into like assessment of the airway. I uh, just want to make sure where I'm at on where you want to stop. Uh, being that it's only 724, I would say <clears throat> if we can get to the end of ABC, because what I kind of had in mind for them was to practice going from BSI all the way to 
to ABC and kind of seeing how the assessment leads them to their decision of do I do ABC or CAB, for example. Okay. Um, and then just kind of get them used to have, seeing how, because that part of the assessment's in order, right? Not everything after the primary, you can kind of jumble around, but this, they have to get it like they know their name. Well, I'm going to, I tell you, I'm going to keep going and you just kind of make sure you shoot me a message on where you may kind of stop just because I, I think I know what we're talking about, but like I said, I got it stopping around 60 something. Um, Cause again, it's like a hundred and almost 170 slides. So kind of picked a good number to stop it. At. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna, so, I'm gonna, while you're teaching, I'm going to pull up on my side and, and take a look. Yeah. Um, I got on 37. Um, just let me know where you want to stop and we'll, I'll get there. All right, so Rob and I have something in plan. That's what we're trying to let y'all know because y'all be like, what? what's he talking about? We, we're going to try to tag team you tonight and get y'all some, some information on both sides. All right, so when I'm looking, when it says scan for signs of uncontrolled bleeding, yes, you're going to eventually see it, but I want to catch it before I'm like, oh my God, there's a lot of blood. Or we may just walk up and see a lot of blood on the ground we got to find out where it's coming from. We need to stop that. Um, uncontrolled external bleeding takes priority over other assessments. And it does because you lose so much. Bye-bye. You ain't going to remake that real quick. You got to have a transfusion or an infusion to get that blood back. So if it means like, hey, like I see a lot of blood on the ground. We need to figure out where this guy has been shot, stabbed, cut, something. We need to find it and fix it now. Um, we need to find it. We got to start doing our assessment, like our physical hands on. We need to pull the shirt up, check his stomach, check his chest, check his back, check his legs until we find exactly where it's leaking from. And I like to use leaking because it could be pouring. Who knows? Uh, the level of consciousness can tell you a great deal about the patient's neurologic and physiological status. So if I again ask, hey, Mr. Smith, how you doing? It's Wally. Can I help you? Yes. And they take that long to answer. Well, you're like, been to Mr. Smith's house a lot. He don't ever answer that slow. And he's always grumpy. Something can trigger and hopefully you, you're good enough to pick up these signs that something's wrong. That's not Mr. Smith. Or he answers you very sporadic like a while ago. And I was like, purple. Um, hello? You know, so way that they answer in their level of consciousness is going to give you trigger signs on what to, you know, the neurologic and psychologic conditions. So that's just a sample. Uh, assessment of an unconscious patient focuses first on airway, breathing, and circulation. That is your number one thing that you want to check besides bleeding. So you have ABCs and uncontrolled bleeding. That's it. It's what we need to know. Sustained unconscious Unconsciousness should warn you that the, circ the circulation, respiratory, the critical respiration, uh, circulatory, and central nervous system problems are deficient, might exist. So we need to fix those. Again, you got to have the respiratory and the heart for things to happen. You start going down that further road and you're not realizing things, they're just going to keep going, diving off down and not being able to pick anything up. So we need to be cautious and look to seeing where we're at. How do I treat my patient? What's wrong? You know, potentially what did I miss? Uh, or what have I not seen yet? Um, conscious with an altered uh, level of consciousness may be due to inadequate perfusion. You may have a medicine problem, drugs, alcohol, or poisoning. So all those things, and you're like, man, that, that can be a lot of things that cause uh, unconsciousness. That's right. That's not even counting what you didn't see. Maybe the guy went to the restroom and passed a lot of blood when he sat down. Well, he didn't pass out until he got back into the living room. Well, you're not going to see that because it's long gone. So now you got to start figuring these things out. Um, we're not necessarily going to see any type of poisoning unless it could be medication poisoning, could be uh, intentional or unintentional poisoning. We may not see those things. Um, 
medications, you know, you could potentially look around and if there's a bottle of, let's just say Tylenol that has a hundred uh, prescribed p uh, pills of Tylenol. Well, he got those filled on today's the 25th. He got them filled on the 20th and it says, take one a day. Well, there was a hundred. So something's missing. So that may be a medication or an intentional or unintentional poisoning. Um, to assess responsive use, so y'all need to write this down. I'm telling you, here's gonna be a test question. This is a mnemonic um, of called AVPU. So AVPU stands for A-V-P-U, stands for Awake Verbal Pain and Unresponsiveness. Ish, Rob, yes. So Avpu. So awake and alert can talk to normal. Well, that's what we're doing right now. I am a I'm I circle A on the Avpu scale. Rep rep responsive to verbal stimuli. And they attempt to respond when talked to him or her, when I talk to them. They're trying to give me information. Uh, <laughs> all right. So response to pain. Now I respond painful stimulus. So when I go, uh, how do I put that? So I can use the, um, I'll show you right here. It's going to show you. So unresponsive, yes, that's very obvious. I hope I don't have to explain that. But what I want to explain is the painful responsiveness. All right, so painful stimuli tests determine whether a patient who does not respond to verbal stimuli will respond to painful stimuli. So Pinching the patient's skin, uh, back of the upper arm, I call that the old sweet meat, that'll get you, the trapeze area, or applying upward pressure along the ridge of the uh, uh, orbital rim along the underside of the eyebrow. Mm, I don't know if I would use that one. Or a patient who moans or withdraws from response to the stimuli. So you can see. I would do this. So this one's there trying to pinch the side of the cheek right here or right here on the collarbone. Those are the avenues that I would go because if you start messing with somebody's eye, could cause an issue. So Michaela talks about the sternum rub. So we are moving away from the sternum rub because that has been abused too much. So what the sternum rub is, is you take one knuckle or two knuckles and you stick in the center of their chest and you rub up or down. Well, anybody even that fakes it is going to wake up because they're like, oh my God, that is not comfortable. Some people have a very high pain tolerance and won't really notice it and rock on and they just kind of be there with it. But not many people that I've messed with have that issue. So that is what you're wanting to check the painful stimuli. So there's an example of what you can do, uh, remember, make it appropriate for the patient. Um, be cautious of what you use, uh, pinching the cheek, because if you actually cause a bruise, you injured the patient. Uh, Rob, you want to share that one now? It was funny. I was just telling Justin about it, and then I looked at the, um, at the chat and saw somebody else say a good old sternum rub. Uh, when we start doing skills, please do not actually sternum rub your classmates when we um, when I tell you that they're unresponsive. They're not. They're not really unresponsive. They'll 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 get mad at you. I'll just say that uh, it happened to us. It was two, two three classes back. <clears throat> they did it. They one of their skills assessments. Guy just got down and sternum rubbed one of his classmates pretty hard, um, and we all saw pretty quick how fast it would elicit a response. Sorry, I had to go steal a bottle of water for myself over there. So be cautious using the sternum rub. It, it, it can put you in a tricky situation. All right, so orientation test, mental status by checking a patient's memory uh, and their thinkability, uh, their thinking ability. So evaluate the patient's ability to remember person, place, and time. Again, those are simple questions 
Um, like if their family's around, we can ask, hey, who's this person right here? Well, they're aware of that. Where are we right now? We're in the Gulf of Mexico on an oil platform. Well, I know those things. And what time is it? Well, I don't know. I have to look at my watch, tell you what time it is, or even what time of day it is. So the event describes what happened. Do you remember what happened prior to you waking your eyes, you know, waking up and I'm sitting in your bedroom with you asking these weird questions? Um, it says you might have a care provider say, patient is A and O times three or four. This refers to being responsive to one or all four of the above. So that's very important because it is checking your alert and oriented, so that's what A and O stands for, is you are awake and oriented times three, which means may you may be alert to person, place, and time, but not the event. And that is common. Uh, person A and O times four means they're like you and I, we know what's going on. Most of the time, if you go to somebody and you're asking these questions and they're a little like, I don't know, they're going to be A and O times three. That, that's normal. Uh, majority of the patients we deal with huh, are unfortunately A&O times three. Um, a deviation from alert and oriented to a person, place, and time event from the patient's normal status is the baseline. It's considered to be a altered mental status. So uh, to get a altered mental status is any deviation from knowing any of those questions, oriented to person, place, and time, and event that says that you're deviated a little bit from the patient's normal status. Now, if you go to a nursing home and you start asking these questions and they're all over and you look at the, the nurse or the, uh, the aide that's there, they're like, no, 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 Rob's always like that. He only knows about half the time he's around. No pun intended, but maybe it fits. So those are some of the things that we need to know what their baseline mental status is. If that's normal, and it changes at all, that's an altered level of consciousness. Even though that our baseline that we got, he is not really oriented to really anything. So it may be A and O times four or A and O times zero because he just doesn't know. So, or if you get even one and during your transport, the pers this person's like, where are we at? What are we doing? Uh, yeah, I thought we just went over that. Could also mean there's a neurological issue there. Identify and treat life threats. We talked about this a while ago, but I want to break it down even more of some of the conditions that cause such sudden death. So we have airway obstruction, respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, shock, severe bleeding, and primary cardiac arrest. Now, can all eventually lead to the last one. Um, and the and it may be an airway obstruction is what has caused the cardiac arrest because they went into respiratory failure. Um, they could have certain things that put them into respiratory arrest. So all of those can bounce off of each other and lead forwards and backwards. Or eventually the bad thing is you're going to be doing CPR anyway because some of those things may take place. In most cases, identifying and correcting life threats issues uh, begins with the airway, followed by the breathing and circulation, your ABCs. That may be part of the reason why you're there. In some cases, it is more appropriate to address life threats and circulations uh, following a sequence of circulation, airway, and breathing. So you may hear it be called CAB because they want the circulation is done first because that's a life threat. If I'm bleeding out of my arm and it's an artery squirt, I need to fix that before I fix the airway because if I don't fix that, I have to fix the airway. And now we out of blood because I didn't fix the obvious life threat. So you can interchange those areas to where from ABCs to CAB because circularization does also need to be fixed because if that is a life threat. Y'all clear on that? Clear as mud, is everybody confused still? If so, we're doing good. No, I'm just kidding. I hope y'all are picking up what I'm putting down. All right, so how do you assess the airway? What am I looking for? As you move through the primary assessment, stay alert 
I want you to look for signs of airway obstruction. Um, ensure that the airway is open and they, it, it's called patent. As long as they can talk to you, like I'm doing right now, my airway is patent because I'm controlling it by myself. It means it's open. I, I, you're not required to do anything to make me breathe. All right, so it's make sure, remember that it's patent. So it's an open airway. All right, so if I'm talking to you and we're going through here and I start having trouble talking and I can start having deep breaths and then I'm just like, that was your signs and symptoms to, that was your signs earlier that there's a potential airway problem coming along and you didn't pick up on the signs. Now you're like, hey, bro, hey. Oh man, he ain't breathing. Well, that's your fault. You should have picked up on that when I started changing and having trouble talking, or I just quit talking and started having issues with my breathing and you noticed those signs because you're like, oh, he went to eight times a minute. That, that, that's not good. So there's that. All right, responsive patients. I promise y'all it's gonna all make sense. I promise you it is. Patients of any age who are talking or crying have an open airway. I love when you get a phone call or 911 call, patient's unresponsive, patient can't breathe, and you get there and they're screaming, I can't breathe. If you would hush, I promise you, you could breathe fine. So I always say when people are screaming and hollering and saying, I can't breathe, I can't get my breath, to stop doing that, and you can. Um, a conscious patient who cannot speak or cry most likely is having an airway obstruction. There may be something blocking their airway. Uh, Lakeisha is saying something to think about. Well, did I, did I miss something or did I say something? Maybe she'll type it in and see you in a second. Um, so if I'm able to realize that something has caused the airway obstruction, I need to identify that, stop the assessment, and clear the airway. It may mean for me to do the Heimlich maneuver and remove that air that obstruction. If your patient has a difficulty breathing or is not breathing, take immediate actions. I don't want you to be like, I gotta fix their airway now. Well, yes. But that's your job. Uh, I know you said something about screaming, but saying you can't breathe. I'm going to remember that. It, it's, I am a very compassionate person. Um, I know some of y'all may not think that. I'm pretty sure the further we go throughout this module and, and course, you're going to be like, he lied. He's not the nicest in the world. But I promise you, my bedside manner, I, I treat everybody like their family. I try my best to make sure that everybody's treated with the same level of care. I don't care if you're you know, a death row inmate or a newborn, you're still going to get the same treatment and the level of care because I, I truly believe in that. But again, the, if I'm going to tell you, if you would stop screaming and hollering, you can be great. So again, back to that. So remember, if it's your job to fix their airway problems, if you realize during your ABC assessment and their airway is starting to have problems, fix it. Put them on oxygen. If just a little bit of oxygen fixes your problem, you, you just did something and now you're a hero to them. Um, now you're like, wow, I, just put, I can breathe now. Because you quit hollering. Works. Um, unresponsive patients. Immediately air, assess the airway and make sure that it's patent. Is it open and can they breathe on their own? Because that's important. If I'm stuck dealing with just their airway, I can't address the other injuries that they have. Maybe I can secure their airway in a few minutes, and then I can get to some other injuries that they have. But if I don't fix that ABC, the airway first, I'm, I'm going to be chasing my tail every time I try to make a turn. If there is potential trauma, uh, use the jaw thrust maneuver uh, to open the airway. Do not use a head tilt chin lift if you suspect any type of cervical injury, all right? If you cannot attain a patent airway, use the jaw thrust maneuver 
or if it's con been confirmed that the patient has not experienced a traumatic event, then you can use a head tilt chin lift. So I'm gonna ask you all a question. You walk up to a house, you got called for an unknown man in the yard. I want y'all to type it in the box. You don't have to tell me. If you walk up and you see the man laying in the yard, unresponsive, and there's a ladder that appears to be leaning next to the, the house. Christmas lights and that and everything's still on the ground. Do we treat him as a traumatic or non-traumatic? So do what I'm asking is, would I use the head tilt chin lift or would I use the jaw thrust? Tell me what y'all would do. Again, this is your assessment. I can't tell you that you're wrong because you made the assessment, but remember, you're trying to do the best thing for the patient. All right, so if I walk up to somebody's house because a 911 call came in as the guy is an unknown, when I get there, I see a man laying in the front yard, unresponsive. There's a ladder leaning against the house, but there's still Christmas lights and everything are on the ground. Am I going to treat it as a traumatic issue and do a jaw thrust, or am I going to do an, uh, a head tilt chin lift because I'm not, it's going to be an un, it's a, it's a stable patient? Which one would y'all use? I think majority that I'm seeing is going to treat it as a traumatic injury because it's potentially, we don't know, we can look at the scene and it tells us that it's a possible traumatic issue and that the patient fell off the house. Well, maybe he ain't even started and had a heart attack in the front yard. But nobody's there to tell us that. So all we can do is go off of what our, our spider senses is telling us and it looks to be a traumatic. I would treat that patient as a traumatic issue. So here, read what it says. So unresponsive, immediately assess the airway, use the jaw thrust technique when necessary, use the head tilt chin lift technique when, when necessary. Relaxation of the tongue muscles is cause of airway obstruction. Now, you're not going to swallow your tongue, but you're, when your tongue is relaxed, and you're laid back, it can block the airway, all right? So let's get that there. Patients with an altered mental status are unresponsive patients cannot protect their own airway. You must open their airway for them. A snoring patient, perform a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust and insert a airway adjunct. We'll go over what those particular adjuncts are later. If they're gurgling and it sounds like they're drowning on water, use your suction device. If they're crowing and have strider, you wanna provide oxygen and artificial ventilations. And yes, we will cover that later when into the respiratory chapter. But we know that we can, just opening the airway, that patient may be like, <laughs> that's probably all that they needed is just their, their junk is not in the right position for them to breathe and they just need you to realign them. They're still unresponsive, yes, but we're trying our best and non-invasively to fix what's going on. Maybe we have to put an airway adjunct in there to help control that airway and push forward. And we're still doing fine. Signs of obstruction in an unconscious patient, uh, obvious trauma, That that's, that's a given. Blood or other obstruction. If you see the obstruction in their mouth, like their mouth is full of blood and our teeth, who knows what else is out there that could be in the airway. That's, that's obvious. Noisy breathing, such as snoring or bubbling, gurgling, crowing, strider, or other abnormal, abnormal airways. Now, I'm not trying to say whomever is married or lives at home and there are other their spouse, partner is snoring because they're sleeping and you walk up and do a head tilt chin lift. I'm not saying that you're not going to get hit. I'm not saying you are going to get hit. But they're not going to be a happy character. I can just tell you. So make sure you do it in the appropriate situation. And then if you have extremely shallow or absent breathing and shallow is when you're sitting here and we're taking normal deep breaths. That's our normal breath. But shallow is 
that's that's not gonna work. It's it's just not enough oxygen to move in and out of the lungs for them to sustain life. Or kind of obvious if they're just not breathing at all, we, we we need to fix that. Yes, 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 we do. We need to fix that. All right. Does anybody have any questions on assessing the airway? We don't think we're fixing to hit breathing right here. Uh, maybe a couple of more slides, and then Rob's going to kick in and, and help some uh, help things make a little bit smoother sounding to you guys. All right, so we're going to assess breathing. How are we going to do that? So once you've made sure that the patient's airway is open, make sure the patient's breathing is present and adequate. Is it enough to sustain life? If it's not, we have to fix that in our ABCs. You assess the patient's breathing, ask the following question. Is the patient breathing? Yes, I know that's retarded sometimes to ask simple questions, but guess what? We have to ask simple questions to make it make sense. Is the patient breathing adequately? See, simple question. Is the patient hypoxic? Who knows what hypoxic is? Somebody tell me. Google it real quick so everybody's like, oh, I can do this. So Google it real quick and tell me what hypoxic is. I'll wait. Somebody's got to be typing it in there. The, it's the condition in which the body or region of the body is deprived of adequate oxygen supply at the tissue level. So we're depriving the body of oxygen, okay? So you're going to see signs of hypoxic. You'll see the blueness in there in the lips and the blueness in the fingertips and the nails. But those are late signs. We're not going to be like, oh, he's hypoxic. we got to fix that because they've been hypoxic. We, we need to fix that quickly so they're not going down. So Rob has broke it down into what the words mean, if y'all remember, uh, the, the pre and the post word. So hypo means low, oxia means oxygen. So low oxygen. See, Rob just made a funny. Chapter five, whoever remembers that? Ba -doom -doom. Breaking it down. All right. So positive pressure ventilation should be performed with patients who are not breathing or whose breathing is too slow or shallow. Read yours on the screen. I'm going to give you all some information, though. If the patient is breathing adequately but remains hypoxic, administer some oxygen. The goal of oxygenation is for most patients is oxygen saturation at 94 to 99%. Okay, that's what we want. We want to see them at 94 to 99. If a patient seems to develop difficulty breathing after your primary assessment, you should immediately reevaluate the airway. So once I've already done the assessment and then I turn around and say that Oh my God, I'm noticing that their airway, like their, their respirations are coming down. Give them some oxygen. Maybe sit them up a little bit on the stretcher instead of having them lay flat. Sit them up a little bit. May notice your increase of uh, respirations. Consider providing positive pressure ventilations with a patient with an airway adjunct. So if I put an airway adjunct in somebody's uh, nostril or their mouth, I need to provide oxygen. So the respirations exceed 28 breaths a minute. Respirations are fewer than eight times a minute. And respirations are too shallow to provide adequate air exchange. That's when I'm going to put something in there with an adjunct for them to breathe better. Okay. Yo, you, you follow me? Shallow respirations can be identified by little movement of the chest, which is reducing the tidal volume. Remember, I remember I know it's going over that, but now it's going to start making sense. And they're just going to have poor chest excursion. They're just not going to be able to push that air in and out. So what we're going to do is provide positive ventilation and hopefully 
that we can help them increase their chest uh, expansion and increase their, uh, their oxygen saturation. That's our overall goal. Now, we wanna do the least evasive that we have to do for the betterment of the patient. But if you have to drop a airway adjunct nasal or oral, that's fine, but follow that up with positive pressure ventilation. And we mean just as simple as a mask of oxygen. Uh, we'll go over the different types later on, but just providing some simple airway uh, oxygen provided to their airway adjunct can help increase and change your patient's status very easily. And you haven't done a whole lot. Um, observe how much effort is required for the patient. So I want to look at this patient. I want to know how hard is it for them to have retractions, use of accessory muscles. Is the nasal flaring with their nostril flaps up and down like that? It's nasal flaring. You'll like that. You won't forget that. Accessory muscles. Do I see their stomach going out, their chest going in, their chest going out, stomach in? That's use of accessory muscles. So when I have to or three words, and then I'm out of air. That's one or that's two or three word dyspnea. Means they're having trouble speaking sentences. They're in the tripod position, feet standing on the ground, hands across the table or the, the chair, and they're letting gravity pull their chest down. So they don't have to use the, uh, the intercostal muscles to help them breathe as much. So the sniffing position is when I'm sitting like this, a lot of times infants are put into the sniffing position on a normal basis just for their airway to be open better. But the sniffing positions, obviously when we smell something that smells good, we're like, oh, that smells good. What's that smell? I, I can't smell right now, but no, I don't have COVID. I'm just stopped up. But that's the sniffing position where their head is extended and their nose is up in the air. We're trying to sniff. So and then when we refer to labored breathing, you're not going into labor and not breathing while in labor, but you still want to do that while you're in labor. But you're having trouble with your breathing and it's, it's just not regular. All of those things that I just discussed are showing signs of how you assess their breathing. And those are gonna be your telltale signs that something's wrong. You need to help them. If you don't do something soon, they're going to go into respiratory failure or rest because we didn't we didn't act early enough. Respiratory distress is increased effort or their rate. Um, if they're having to work harder to breathe, or their effort uh, they increase the effort or the rate. Those are things that's going to be how I assess it. Or they breathe in normally, or their labored breathing, or their respirations are increasing. And they're just having to work harder to breathe and get supplement or get oxygen on a normal basis. That tells me I need to oxygenate. Respiratory failure occurs when the blood is inadequately oxygenated or ventilated inadequate to meet the oxygen demands of the body. The ultimate resort of respiratory failure, if the ultimate resort of respiratory failure if not corrected. Probably gonna be CPR started because it failed. So what it is telling me is that there's not enough oxygen in their blood to oxygenate the rest of the body, okay? Because we're not breathing right and we're having been breathing like this for a couple of hours. Well, baby, why didn't you call me earlier? I didn't wanna bother you. My job. So again, again, reminding these people that that's what you're there for, and that if they would have called you earlier, we could have helped them sooner. And that would, just involving that. So we've gone over how to assess their breathing and understanding why that's important and where we are on moving forward from that point. Is you see all these signs, you try to pick up all this and go from there. And that's really hard to do when you, you're still learning because you're like, oh my God, he won't stop talking. I don't, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions, but nobody's really wanting to say anything and that's okay. 
but we want you to understand this and make sense so you are able to pick this up. Um, hang on one second, y'all. I want to look at something. Uh, Hey, Rob, I will go through slide 68, and I'm on 57 right now, so that is uh, not too far. Just want to kind of give okay. you that. Yeah, basically, once you get through their ABCs, I'm good from there. If you want to grab a couple more slides, that's up to you. So now I had to pause the slide so y'all didn't see everything. All right, can y'all see that? We says assess the circulation. Yeah, you're good. All right, so now we're gonna check on your mental status. Some of us may not want that to be checked. Um, so I wanna know, are they, do, are they circulation? Do they have any circulation? Is there a pulse? That, that's, that's important. Um, what is their skin condition? So this is where we wanna know what type, like, so right there on your screen, skin condition. Are they pale or molted? molted? And that is an onset of shock. That is a telltale sign. They are cyanotic with late signs of shock. Now, are they red? So that is anaphylactic or vasogenic shock. I know y'all don't know the difference. It's okay. We'll get there. Potential poisoning. That's the carbon monoxide to poison. Overdose or other medical condition that may cause the redness of the skin. Or are they just cool and clammy and you're like, hmm, something, something's wrong. That's also a sign of shock. Let's, let's go into a little bit more. Come on, computer. All right, to assess the pulse, I want you to determine if there's even a pulse present. You will need to palpate the pulses. And remember, there's several different places that you can check. We can start at the feet, that's the dorsal pulse. If you need to go that far, we have the femoral pulse. Again, that is a little personal until you know where it's at and you're comfortable with that. Don't go there first. Check the radial pulse. Remember, it's right here on the wrist, but I want to use my two fingers, okay? Radial, and you have your brachial, and you have your carotid. So we can assess those. And then just because you may have issues filling the carotid, I mean, the brach radial pulse, maybe the body's not perfusing enough and getting the blood to flow. So don't just stop. You're like, oh, God, I don't, I don't feel a radial pulse. Check the other arm. Uh, and then turn around and check for the brachial. And then if you're like, okay, well, I feel it up there, but I don't feel it further down. Know in your head that something's going on that the body's not perfusing enough. And an unresponsive patient older than one years of age, you should palpate the cricoid pulse in the neck. Uh, Palpate the brachial pulse located at the medial area inside the upper arm. I don't know if you see that right here. In children younger than one year. If you cannot palpate a pulse, start CPR. Um, if they are unresponsive and no pulses, time to get sweaty, boys and girls. We're going to start our CPR. Hope you paid attention in CPR class. Um, perfusion is assessed by evaluating a patient's skin, color, temperature, moisture and capillary refill. How do you check your capillary refill? Well, here you go, you hold your finger, and you push it. What, how long does it take for the pinkness underneath the nail to return, okay? That lets us know how much oxygen is throughout the blood. Now it's not gonna be like, oh, that's 27%, he needs oxygen. The longer it takes, it lets you know that there's not enough oxygen in the blood, all right? So again, we talked about the patient's skin color. We want to know, let's go back. So y'all have any questions, y'all can still write it down. Here's our skin color condition. Pale, cyanotic, red, or cool and clammy. All right. So then we're going to check on temperature. Now, some of your ambulances have the temporal little, little trigger thing. Then you check your temperature. Those are not or say so accurate. We use those because that's the COVID standards, but the good ones either underneath the arm or underneath the tongue. We need to make sure of that. Why do we want to know their moisture level is, are they sweating? Are they perfusing? You know, what's potentially wrong? Uh, Rob says, 
to second rule sucks and get messed up for a lot of various reasons. But cap refill is a fantastic for trending. If it was three seconds to start, but now it's five seconds, that making that's bad. Rob, you're gonna have to explain that to them because I don't think they're gonna pick up from that. So, you know, you were just talking about cap refill. The two second rule that most people try to go off of is lobbying, you know, for um for the cap refill. So many things can change that. Cold fingers, gender, um, obviously fingernail polish where you can't see the fingernail bed anyway. Um, genetics, all these different things can slow your cap refill down past two seconds. So if you're looking at it like, you know, I was always taught that under two seconds is good, over two seconds is bad. If, if that's how you're looking at it, you probably, you may misjudge your patient. Um, somebody can be perfectly normal with a three to four second cap refill. But if you check it at first and it's, it's, let's say it's three to four seconds and then five minutes later you check it and now it's five to six seconds, that's what trending is, right? So now it, since it's been there, it has gotten worse. That's, that's different. That would be bad. If it's three to four seconds, it stays three to four seconds, that might be normal for them. That's what I was getting at there. Oh. Three to four seconds, that might be normal for them. That's what I was getting at there. So, and, and he gave a good point is you want to know the trending, is it improving or is it getting worse? That's, that's what he's meaning by trending. And you can continuously check that for uh, the status of your patient. Um, so we talked about skin color. Uh, poor peripheral circulation will cause the skin to appear pale, white, ashy. See, that's what I meant by ashy or gray. High blood pressure may cause the skin to be abnormally flushed and red. Uh, when the blood is not properly saturated with oxygen, it appears blue. Um, here is you a picture of the blueness. You see this young baby, is it's a little pale. It's not perfusing enough to get circulation. You can see it mainly around the mouth and the nose. And then if you could probably see the fingers, they probably had a little bit of paleness. You see it in the chest underneath the arm. But uh, the gum is still pink and white, so that's, that's good, but it's starting to get worse. Um, so high blood pressure, so just because their skin is red and they uh, appear to be like, don't just automatically assume, but like, you got high blood pressure. Maybe, but just make those notifications, write them on your glove and you can go from there, start checking their blood pressure and you're like, whoa, bro, you're like 180 over 130. Is that normal for you? Yeah, I'm on 14 different blood pressure medicines. I'm sure you've got them in your purse too, don't you? So they're gonna wanna take all that with them. That's just a picture of way that you can see. So skin temperature, normal skin temperature be warm to the touch, abnormal or super hot, which we know we can, like when you check for fever, you feel on somebody and you're like, whoa, you're, you're kind of hot. Um, cool, cold and clammy. One of those you stick to them and your clammy's like, mm, you you sticky. Like what, don't, don't touch me, you, you sticky. Um, I always like to say, especially with the young kids that come in, they've been hot and sweaty, they run around outside playing and you touch them and they're like, oh, that's, that's gross. That's kind of the feel that you get when you talk about being clammy, uh, partic particularly if you're going into like a shock or a cardiac uh, occurrence, that's the kind of feeling that they'll be cool, cold and clammy. Uh, moisture, skin that is wet, moist or excessively dry and hot suggest a problem. Um, you can kind of see those uh, cardiac related issues, heat, uh, heat emergencies. Uh, you know, when a patient stops sweating, that's, that's the worst. We don't want them to stop sweating. Um, that can be signs of a heat stroke. Um, but, you know, dry skin, we all go around all day long with dry skin, which is great. We're fine. Uh, we, we add lotions or other type of you know, skincare products to kind of improve that. But when it becomes wet and moist, that, that's our problem is we know that there may be an underlying issue or they're just having circulation problems. So we talk about cap refill and we'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, Rob talked about this, removing the patient's fingernail. Not, well, how about polish so you can press on the fingernail uh, re remove the pressure and the nail bed should restore. So here's a picture. Ta-da! I'm a picture kind of person. So on picture A, we're applying pressure and then we release it. And you count how long it returns to turn back to the normal pink. 
I know a bunch of you were trying to do that now. You're like, hey, one, two, three. You're going to do it to yourself. And you're building in your brain, doing that now, a baseline set of normal capillary refill. And that's great. We want you to do that. Pick up those baseline skills because you'd be like, is mine normal? And tomorrow you're going to find somebody be like, hey, let me see something. I, I remember doing it. Uh, I used to do it to my babies all the time. Be like, oh, I'm going to check their cap refill. Every time I was in paramedic school, my son was young. I'd come home and do like pediatric stuff to him. I never started an IV on him when he was young, but I was able to, you know, poke him probably like, okay, this is the femur. You know, this is this, this is the patella. And I went all over it. My ex-wife was like, leave this baby alone. I didn't hurt him. All right. So assess this uh, control external bleeding. Again, that is a life threatening issue, we need to fix that first. This should occur before addressing any airway problems. Uh, bleeding from a large vein is characterized by a steady flow of blood. Bleeding from an art artery is characterized by a spurting flow of blood. We've all seen, and some of you have may seen this in person. Some of you may not have, but when you get these, the squirt and it's, and it's shooting out like a water hose, but it's it's pulsating. It's because every time the heart beats, blood's flowing. That's, a, that's an artery. Um, you've all cut yourself at least once in your life, I'm sure. But it's just a steady flow of blood. That, that's your normal vein. Those are the small ones. Your arteries are your bigger ones. Those are the ones we need to be more cautious of. Let's see here. Control of sternal bleeding is often very simple. You want to apply direct pressure first. Uh, with your gloved hand and maybe some four by fours, uh, some gauze, we want to apply direct pressure. If that does not work, we can apply a tourniquet. And remember, a tourniquet applies pressure to the area to stop the, uh, the blood flow. Now, uh, applying a tourniquet is high and tight. You can always apply one. If you need another one down the road, you can apply a second one. I'm not gonna say continue the third and fourth, but then after that, check the, the tightness of the windage. And then when you start to tighten down on it, that can also fix your problem. Maybe it wasn't tight enough. Uh, so we're gonna perform a rapid uh, exam. This is gonna be my last slide for the evening. Uh, Rob will pick up and then we'll, I'll give you a code after a while. All right, so to perform a rapid scan, what, well, that should be simple to us on what we want you to do. Again, don't take any more than 60 to 90 seconds and think about your timeline. I'm doing a rapid assessment. So this is quick, down and dirty, 60 to 90 seconds. I need to touch them. Okay, this is not a systemic or a focused physical, physical exam. I'm just doing what, what I see. Okay, I see blood, need to stop, need to check that. I noticed they're having trouble breathing. Need to fix that. Continue your assessment. That's a rapid exam. Point proven. Done. Now, you tell me what questions you have about the last 68 slides that I covered. Anybody? Rob? Don't be afraid to ask questions, people. There's a lot to this chapter, and it's going to be the basis for everything you do from here to the end. So if something doesn't make sense, it will as we go forward. But if, you know, to get that understanding tonight, um, if you got anything, shoot it up. We're going to do some practice here soon so you can kind of see how it flows. But what, what we wanted to do is this chapter is very, very deep. Uh, Rob and I talked a long time ago that this chapter needed to be divided into two different lectures. So, because I can, y'all can't imagine me teaching 160 some odd slides to you guys and they'd be like, all right, good luck on your test. I've set you up for failure and, and I refuse to do that. So Rob and I talked and that's the reason why we divided it into two nights. Again, y'all are probably going, oh my God, is a lot. I don't, I don't know what he said. I want you to ask me those questions. Rob's here. Let's ask those. I know another great friend of Rob and I's both is in the background. We can we can aggravate Justin and, and get his input. We've got some great people here to ask. I don't know everything. I think I do, but my wife tells me I don't. 
So ask these questions to us. Let us help you get a better grasp of this assessment. Hey, Rob, it's quiet. I'm gonna turn it over to you, sir. All right, do me a favor. Um, pull up the BLS and the medical assessment. And I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna short talk them through a little bit of things while you while you do that. And you you can show either one. Uh, I, think, I tell you what, show the, show the medical assessment. But go ahead and, and try to grab both of them. So, uh, the national the checkoff sheet. What you, yeah. All right, stand by. I'm gonna pause the screen. Okay. Um, so you guys know, everything you do in your skills for your psychomotor day is gonna be based off of these checklists. And if any of you have been EMRs before, uh, you've already seen these. The checklists are the same for EMR as they are for a paramedic. The only real difference is what are you allowed to do for your interventions? But the checklist, your, your guide of going through these things is all the same. And it starts off with taking care of yourself first, make sure that you're safe all the way through your patient care, focusing and helping you to remember to focus on the priorities first. Uh, life threats first, then you can go, you know, the broken bone is not gonna kill them unless it's a certain bone. And then you just go from there. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we're gonna go over the scene size up and the primary. Uh, for the assessment as a whole, what you learned tonight has to be learned in order. You have to know your scene size up in order, you have to know your primary in order, and don't mess those up. So that's why we stopped where we stopped, and we're gonna keep on going. On the next night, on Thursday, you guys are gonna pick up with the secondary assessment, which is a little bit different because that's your vital signs, your history, all that stuff, and that, you can do it any order you want, as long as you get it done. So tonight's the night, though, that I want you guys to remember it and learn like clockwork. We're going to start. I'll show you guys once the uh, screen comes up how you can kind of um, shorten these things so that you can be a little bit more efficient with it. You can figure out how it goes, but still actually pass your, your assessments and everything. And knowing this, will also help you on the written test because a lot of your assessments are gonna give you question, or a lot of your questions are gonna give you assessment scenarios where it puts you somewhere in the middle of a call and you have to figure out based on the question where you are in your assessment to know what your next step is. And all four options on that test are gonna be actual assessment things that you would do, but only one of them is next. So, you know, it's questions like that that make people say that the registry's got all right answers and you have to pick the most right. It's not really true. It's just the, uh, the questions are, they're not gonna make anything apparent to you um, as to what they're looking for. You have to be able to kind of see it. And that's that's a lot, a lot of times it's easier said than done. Uh, where you at, Chris? You got the, got one of them up? So I have the patient assessment medical. What's the other one? BLS, if you want, um, have go ahead and show the, the medical assessment. That's fine. That's fine. We can do it with just medical. I got I to find it. Hang on. <laughs> What's going on on my screen? All right. What are you looking at? All right. Before we get started, um, you spoke his name, man. Here, <laughs> he's, got, he's got some input. Go ahead, Justin. Hey everybody, so uh, Justin Miller here, one of the uh, senior instructors with the dairies, and uh, just a couple, just something from the real world perspective to think about having listened to all these 68, 60 plus slides tonight on, um, you know, patient assessment. Uh, Chris alluded to it multiple times in his presentation, and, and it's absolutely true when it comes to being a person, being a being a real person and and again we're learning this stuff kind of robotically uh so that you can pass your national registry exam right and so we want you to do that but at some but in your by by proxy you're going to absorb all this information and you'll have it down pat but when you actually get to have to use it when you have to go into somebody's home at three o'clock in the morning on the worst day of their life uh, and try to pull this information out of somebody who's writhing in pain right? It's, it's always a challenge. And so, uh, again, being empathetic and being an actual person uh, while, while simultaneously doing, this, uh, doing these assessments is absolutely key. 
And so when you take when you take that uh, bedside manner, like Chris alluded to, uh, that's that's something that is very important. And how you phrase some of these things, you know, like he said, hey, hey, ma'am, how are you doing tonight? Where are you hurting at? Right. And, you know, some of those things are very generalized questions, because, again, these people may not, you know, don't know, uh, uh, ma'am, what's your level of consciousness? And can you tell me what your breathing rate is? You know, that's it's just too robotic. And so if you treat them and talk to them like a person, um, but in a manner in which gets you the answers that you need to fulfill these check boxes, then you're then you're really doing something. And so again, all the all the they're not they're no more the wise to what you're doing, and you're getting your information. They're getting some empathy. They're getting some compassion. They're getting that bedside manner, um, and you're getting your questions answered. And that's really where those two collide is uh, is how you conduct yourself. Um, you know. Again, it's the worst thing is for somebody to come in and go, hey, what's going on? You're hurting or what? Or just not you want, say anything. You want to go to the hospital or what? Right? And then we see paramedics every day that do that, EMTs that do that, um, you know, that just come in there, stone-faced, careless, hands in their pocket, no, have no desire to, uh, you know, do any type of diagnostic work or, you know, dig deep and try to find the actual problem. They're just going to load them up and take them to the hospital. And so don't be that person, uh, be empathetic, and, and again, try to make those two worlds collide, the bedside manner and the actual uh, diagnostic part of the, uh, you know, receipt, trying to get this information through the patient assessment. So that's my two cents on that. Y'all have a good night. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, so what you're learning in class, obviously, is going to be a very, yeah, I, I can see it. Um, this is going to be a very systematic approach to things. This is more, a lot of this you're going to find out happens really in your head, but you still have to, especially in class, because we have to see that you know the assessment, so you're going to have to say it out loud and everything, and that is one thing you won't do when you go to a real patient. You're not going to walk in and say, BSI, scene safety, and then, you know, is my scene safe and all that? You'll have to figure it out. So just a quick heads up, the form that you can see right now this is your medical assessment. We also have one for trauma and we have one for BLS, which is CPR. Um, this is what you're going to be graded on when you do your psychomotor assessment at the end of the class. This is what we're going to be doing on each of your skill days. We're gonna build off of these assessments. And right now you're just learning how to get through the assessment. That's all you're doing. There is no interventions. We're not dealing with a cardiac patient. We're not dealing with asthma, none of that. We'll plug that stuff in when we get to those chapters. But, um, as you can see, this is exactly, and this is like a cheat sheet. This is exactly what your evaluator is gonna see. So I wanna point out one thing first. It's not just about you getting all of these points that you see on the side. Look at the bottom of the sheet. Each one of these has critical criteria. If you get a mark on any one of these things, it's an automatic fail. So if you're gonna memorize this sheet, I would start with memorizing what not to do. Um, Cause if like, if you walk in and you forget if you walk in and you forget to put your gloves on or say BSI, well, that's step one. That's a critical fail. You, you don't even get to go any further. They just stop you right there. All right. But um, tonight, what I want to do is just kind of recap what you've learned through 68 slides in one night. So on this sheet, you have your scene size up and your primary survey, or we just call it primary assessment. These two sections need to be done in order. Um, scene size up, technically, no, it doesn't have to be in order and you can miss some of the things in it. However, what I have found is when students don't have that mastered, they mess everything else up because they're trying to figure out what they missed in their side up while trying to move forward with the rest of their assessment. Now they've split their attention and they don't really do so hot. Um, so I want you guys to get th these two sections in order. If you look at your size up plus the one line above it, that's six steps. All right, so three steps, uh, I'm sorry, three priorities, and there's two steps for each one. Who do you think is the most important person on the scene as far as making sure that they are safe, you or the patient? You, because if you're not safe, then you can't take care of the patient who is already unsafe. Exactly. And y'all y'all gonna have to uh, talk back with me because I don't like doing one-way communication. Excellent job. So yeah, the first two steps have to do with your personal safety. Take care of number one, because if you run in and become patient number two, then somebody's got to come save you and them. That doesn't have that you don't want that. So 
BSI means body substance isolation, right? That's putting on your gloves for your actual skills. If you wear gloves, that counts. If you're not wearing gloves, if we, you know, if either you don't have any, maybe we ran out, whatever, just say BSI and that satisfies that, but you got to do one or the other. For steps three and four of your size up, this is your triage, all right? So you're safe. Now, what are you dealing with? Are you dealing with one patient or are you dealing with a busload of kids that got in a wreck? Um, in scenarios, you're only going to have one patient. In the real world, you might have to step over five people before you get to the one you need to work on. So that's what steps three and four are. And then steps five and six have to do with the actual patient, whichever one you're going to work on. And that is, remember you talked about the MOI and the NOI, the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. So it's what are you dealing with? And do you need to, con uh, to consider C-spine? Well, you should always consider it, but not everybody's gonna get a C-collar, right? We already know if, they, if it's trauma, we're gonna be highly suspected of neck injury through our patients. But what about medical? Can anybody think of a medical call where we might need to take care of somebody's neck? Some of you that have already been on calls, I know some of y'all have, have no background in it, but what if somebody falls due to... Head trauma, blood force trauma to the head? Right. Yeah, so I mean, that's going to be what causes it, but there are some medical conditions that will make people black out. They may black oh, out. Oh, you talking about like multiple sclerosis or seizures or something like that? Anything. Could be a seizure, could be a stroke. My point being, though, is that just because you're on a medical call doesn't mean that there's no chance of trauma. So at the bottom of your scene size up, even on the medical assessment, you're still going to have that consideration of C-spine because if they were standing up in the bathroom and had a stroke or they were sitting down on the toilet and pushed too hard and they hit their vagus nerve and blacked out and then they hit their head on the sink on the way down to the floor. Um, these kind of things can cause some trauma, even though it's a medical call. Uh, we won't throw those kind of curveballs at you in class unless you're doing well enough that we think that that's your next step because we're not going to train you to the minimum standard. We're going to keep pushing you. And if you're, you know, the better you do, the harder your scenarios are going to get. But um, so what I wanted y'all to do, read over just the scene size up for now. All right. And remember that every set of two steps is first you're taking care of yourself, then your scene or your triage, and then your patient. So you're starting off basically getting out of the truck and then you're working your way toward your patient as you do the scene size up. So, you know, say it out loud. You don't have to unmute for this part right here, but first steps, BSI scene safety. Once that's done, how many patients do I have? What about the rest of the scene? Because when you're doing your scene size up, you're, you're considering, you know, what if there's one patient and you're the ambulance, that's, that's pretty good. You know, you can carry everybody with that. But if it's a van with five people in it and you're the only ambulance, you're not going to fit all those patients into your truck. So you need more ambulances, possibly more paramedics. What if they hit a telephone pole? These kind of things. So that's steps three and four. All right. And then um, consider your MOI. You know, what's wrong? If it's, if it's trauma, it's a mechanism of injury. If it's medical, then it's a nature of illness. They both kind of have the same concept, so they sit on the same line. In fact, this one doesn't even say it. It'll probably say it on the trauma. But you have to consider that and then um, consider your C-spine from there. So every single scenario you get, I want you to say that scene size up in order. And then the last thing I'm going to say before we start doing some practice runs with it is for your primary. You guys learned tonight that primary assessment is ABC, right? And that's easy. And once upon a time, CPR used to teach you the same thing, but they changed it about, I don't know what, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, now it's CAB. And because we teach the same thing in EMT that we teach in CPR, there's no difference. And you run into the problem of, well, what order am I gonna do it in? Do I do ABC or do I do CAB? And the easiest way to remember that is remember your first two uh, steps of your primary is just looking at your patient. So your general impression, getting your av poo, and do they look sick or not sick, all that stuff. If they're unconscious on the ground, before you decide if it's CAB or ABC, check a pulse. If, they're, if there's no pulse, then you're going to have to do CPR. So that means you're going to be doing compressions, then airway and breathing. So it's CAB. 
if they're unconscious and they do have a pulse, then you don't have to do CPR, they've, they've got a pulse. So no compression is needed. Then you can just do ABC and that's how you're gonna make your decision from there. So what we're gonna do, this will be also be an exercise in seeing who's still actively in the class is um, I'm gonna start, I'll tell you what, I will start with you, Chris, just because I know you know the assessment and you can kind of see, you can, the rest of the class can see how this goes. But um, I'll give you a quick scenario. I want you to go through, just read the scene size up. Y'all, if y'all don't know it and you, you, you uh, students in the class and know you don't, that's okay. Read the sheet, it's right there in front of you. You don't have to memorize it yet. I just want you to get used to it. Um, read through your scene size up. Then when you get to your primary, check, you know, say, what do I see? I'll give you some information. And then based on that, you will tell me whether you're gonna do ABC or CAB. Are you ready, Chris? I will try my best. Um, can All someone, right. yep, uh, Andrea says she can't see it. Yeah, I see that. Um, that's weird, I can see it. Can anybody else not see the sheet? Yeah. Oh, so okay. I, yeah. It's kind of printing it out. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you zoom in, Chris, to show just the size up in the primary? They don't have to. They don't have to see the rest of it. Is that better. There we go. That little yeah, right. Perfect. Okay, so Chris, basically, I'm just going to give you a very basic scenario because we're not even in, um, there's no interventions, so I'm not going to give you anything that matters, no vital signs, none of that stuff. We're just going to go problem. through. I'm a, <laughs> it'll be easy. All right, it'll be easy for everybody. This is just the beginning of it. So, all right, Chris, you went to lunch with your wife at the Mexican restaurant. You walked outside and you found a guy laying unconscious on the ground. That's all you get. All right. So the first thing I want to know is, do I have do I have anything in my pocket to take care of him? Do I have any gloves? Are they in my truck? Because um, I, mm -hmm. I want to protect myself. Yep. And so you have, so you've taken your BB, uh, BSI. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Your BSI precautions. All right. Um, you have gloves and your seam looks safe. So that's, yeah, because I'm walking out. I didn't see anything major, you know, was it like, I didn't see anything that was scared me from not going outside. So I, I, I'm assuming my scene is safe at this time. Yes, scene is safe. Um, do I see anything around that kind of gives me any idea of what potentially happened? Um, nothing, just that one, he, he's just laying on the ground. No and cars around him, no skin marks, no blood. I have any other patients uh, in the immediate area? Nope, just the one. I'm going to reach back and tell somebody inside or my wife to call 911 and give them the exact location. Okay, so you've got additional resources on the way. Now, I don't, since I don't know what happened to him, like I told you guys earlier, that uh, we're just going to assume this is traumatic because we don't know. Um, I'm going to reach down, put my hand on his head hold him in place so he doesn't jerk or anything like that when I try to uh, get his attention, do a sternum rub, or I can get him to do the AVPU scale, you need to know where he's at. So I'm going to hold his head, which that's going to help me consider stabilization of the spine. Okay, so you've considered trauma and you're taking uh, traumatic precautions. All right, so your size up is done. So, so what, I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm going to, hey, the 911 is going to be asking, like, what's wrong? Well, I'm going to say I'm unaware. It appears to be a 35-year-old male that uh, is found unconscious on the floor. I, I don't know what's wrong. Uh, he is breathing. Okay. That's my yeah. general. So, gonna... yeah, so he doesn't. So Chris kind of took that one from me. You've looked at your patient and determined his uh, level of consciousness and your general impression. And you have found that he is unconscious, but breathing. So, Chris, are you going to move forward ABC or CAB? So I'm going to go, if I don't see any immediate uh, traumatic life is, 
I'm going to start with C, uh, A, B, C. There you go. Okay, good. All right. And then that's all that I really want to do tonight. So you guys know what A, B, C stands for. So if your patient is alert, verbal, painful stimulus, or unresponsive with a pulse, they're going to be A, B, C. You're going to, because you don't have to do CPR on a, on a living person, right? Sure. The only time you're going to switch it up is if you, if they're unconscious on the ground that doesn't look like they're breathing and you check a pulse and you don't find it, you'd move into CPR. That's basically the exact same thing they teach you in CPR class. All right. So excellent. Now, um, Chris, being the instructor and having gone through this a lot and having done this for years, um, did a very good job of painting the scene. You know, he was giving as much information as I could. You were fine. But um, you guys, when you do this, y'all don't necessarily have to be that verbal. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're better off saying, like for example, if Chris says, if, if we reverse this and Chris says, all right, you've got a patient un, you know, looks like he's unconscious on the ground outside the Mexican restaurant. You as a student can be like, all right, cool. BSI scene safety. Say those together that knocks out the first two lines right out the gate. Then you can say, is this my only patient or do I have more? All right. Um, do I need any additional resources? Now you can technically answer that question. So if I told you you had three patients, then yes, you would need two more ambulances. So if I told you you had a down power line or a hazmat incident or there's a structure fire or you know whatever, then you would just say, all right, I'm going to need whatever agency I need. And when in doubt, say the fire department, because we handle everything. Um, and then after that, you say, what's my MOI or NOI? So the MOI in these cases is med uh, mechan oh, sorry, no, MOI, NOI, nature of illnesses. This is the opportunity for your evaluator or whoever's leading your scenario to tell you what you're looking at. So they'll give you your NOI, they'll tell you that. And in this case, I would have said, you really don't see any signs of trauma. There's just a guy laying on the ground. That's all you get. So you consider C-spine. I told you there's no signs of trauma. So you're going to always consider C-spine. But that consideration may just lead to a no. No, no, no C-spine needed. Cool. As long as you say, I'm going to consider C-spine, we could uh, mark that off. Then you move to your primary. You have a patient laying unresponsive on the ground. All right. So unresponsive is usually a poor general impression. So you can kind of knock that out the gate right there. And then do your AFPU. If they're unconscious, do a sternum rub or anything, you know, pinch the shoulders, something like that to try to elicit some kind of painful response. If they don't do it and they are truly unresponsive, check a pulse. Because right here, you don't really know if you're going the BLS route or the era medical route. So check a pulse. You're kind of testing the waters of what you learned in CPR. If you think about it, remember we, when we teach you CPR, it's always hey, hey, are you okay? You slap the mannequin and then you check the pulse for 10 seconds and we never give you one because we're wanting to teach you CPR. In this case, you might have one. So if you do, then you say, okay, I'm going to do ABC. If you don't have a pulse, then no, you do need to give them one. So that's going to be CPR. You're going to do CAB. And there's another assessment checklist like this one that is for BLS. It's very, very simple because it's exactly what you learned in CPR, but that's how you're going to know which one you're doing. Um, and then you just go from there. So I'm going to pick or uh, yeah, I'll pick the first one and then we'll go from there. So let's see. I know exactly who I'd like to call on. Let me see if he's here. And he is Bubba. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I had to. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I had to yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. And I can hear myself. And I can hear myself. Okay. So, okay. Um, so at the risk of having feedback issues, let's see how this works. So I'm going to give you a call or a scenario and just, and just run through these two things. If you can do it off the top of your head, because I know you've got a few minutes, but if not, the sheet is right there in front of you. Not. Can you, Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so scene size up in primary size only. Up in primary. You respond to the call of a 22 year old male trouble breathing.
That's all I got. That's all you got. So, all right. so when you do your when you do your BSI and safety, I'll give you a little bit more so that you can do the rest of your size right. Uh, right on scene, BSI. Make sure my scene is safe. Okay, scene is safe. You walk in and you find a patient in the tripod position, breathing heavily like they just ran a marathon. And they see you come in and um, they look like they just got a present for Christmas. Um, all right, I already have uh, ambulances on the way. Okay. Um, it doesn't appear to be any uh, uh, trauma, no mechanism of injury, so I don't have to consider C, C spine. Okay. Um, my general impression of the patient is that he's struggling for air. Okay. Um, he's looking at me, so I mean, he's he's conscious. I know that. Okay, so on the on the four point scale, Abfu, what you're going to give him alert? Alert. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask him, "Are you okay?" If he does, he respond. He tells you that he's having a hard time breathing. No, so he's verbal. The, okay. Well, no, he's alert. He's he's answering you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll I'll talk on that in just a second. So at this point, are you going to do ABC or CAB? ABC. ABC. Good, because he's he's not in cardiac arrest, right? Correct. Okay. Fantastic. So, real quick about Avpu. Verbal doesn't mean that they're answering you. That's that's still alert. When you think about Avpu as a four point scale, I want you to think about it like they're falling asleep. If we're up talking to each other like we are right now. So at least some of us are alert. Some of us may be getting into that safety stage, but um, you're alert. If you're able to follow commands, answer questions, eyes are open, tracking people around the room, that kind of thing, you're, you're alert. You're, you're aware of what's going on. The rest of those steps, the, the VP and you, that's like a patient falling asleep. So imagine that somebody is getting a little hypoxic or just going to sleep on you, and they're not tracking you. They're not answering questions. They're kind of nodding off. And when you're like, hey, and they, huh, well, and, and, but that's all you're getting. They're, they're not following directions or following a conversation. Those things would be verbal. If they're getting deeper into that falling asleep and you shout at them and nothing happens, but then you inflict some kind of pain like a, a sternum rub, then that would be responsive to painful stimuli. And then if nothing happens, if they're completely knocked out, then you're unresponsive. So that's the only thing there. Did uh, anybody catch a couple of things that he missed in the size up? You did good, Bubba. You, uh, he missed, missed two things. Bubba, he missed um, trying to figure out how many patients were there. And then he also um, missed, um, I want to say it was, you know, he jumped straight to the, you know, having EMS on the way, but you didn't know if you needed additional EMS because you didn't know how many patients were, you know, in the perspective, in the vicinity, essentially. Okay. Yeah. So just a couple things in the, um, in the size up bubble. That's all you, that's, that was it. And none of that was a critical fail. So for being the first student to do it, he did great. Uh, he did, he did do his PPE and checking machine. He did say that, which is good because that would be a critical fail. So yeah, you uh, you missed actually just verbalizing that you only had one patient, um, and it was I want to say it was additional resources was the only was the only thing I said that um, those the, oh you did say that? I said EMS was in route that's right okay uh, then it would have only been that one thing I thought there was a second thing you missed but either way this there's two things in your size up. It wouldn't be a big deal. The only time that's going to be a problem is if you realize you missed something and then you're trying to figure out what it was yeah. while you're trying to do the rest of your assessment. So know your critical fails. That way, if you if you get the thought of, hmm, I think I did miss something in my size up, who cares? Keep going. It's just one point. Keep your focus on what's going forward. So you did good. Excellent job. All right. Any volunteers for the next one or do I get to pick again? Let's go. I'll go ahead and step up to the plate. You got this? All right. So you get a patient. Um, so your call just comes out to you altered mental status. That's all you hear. 
Okay, so um, BSE and determining the scene right, status. BSI. BSI. Sorry, I screwed up weird too. <laughs> All right, but that's no, it's okay. Sorry. Uh, is the scene safe? Scene is safe. You walk in and you find a patient that is just staring blankly at the wall. That's so funny. initially, I realized that the patient, sorry, I got my twins in the background. First, it's bedtime. Um, I see that the patient is disoriented. Um, there's nobody else in the room but this one patient. Um, okay. I'm requesting that we have EMS start in route. Um, I do not need to stabilize the spine because the patient um, is breathing. Uh, so this would be ABC. Um, I, I tried to get the patient's attention. Um, well, well, initially what I see is the patient staring at the wall. I'm trying to get their attention. They're not really verbalizing anything to me. They're just, you know, talking into what they're doing. Excellent. And um Perfect. Yeah. So any further than that, you start getting into the secondary and trying to figure out what's wrong. So excellent job. Um, yeah. Tonight, like I said, right now, it's just and it's, it's really short. You guys that are good at this or, or have looked at it before, scene size up in primary happen in a couple of seconds. And that's it. But for those that are still learning it, this takes a little bit. Excellent job. All right. Yeah. Because you recognized ABC. And would you say that and why well, we didn't go into it? If this patient is staring at the wall and you walk in the room and they look at you, it's technically alert, right? They're, they're aware of their surroundings. They know you've entered the room and they see you. If they're staring at the wall and you walk in and they don't, they don't acknowledge you at all, then technically they're that's, not, that's not really, yeah. But they're, they're unresponsive, but not like, Cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest. I mean, I don't, yeah, they're like yeah, verbally, I'm not, I'm they're verbally gonna, unresponsive. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw those kind of curveballs at y'all in the middle of class where it's like, oh yeah, they're awake but unresponsive. Um, if they're unresponsive, they're gonna look dead. What we'll you say that? So, but excellent job. All right. Um Keo, you like going up to uh, up to bat? Let's do it. Let's do it. Right. Uh, you got somebody else in there. Uh, one of y'all may have to turn your volume all the way down. Okay, let's give it a shot. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you're going to get a call. Let's see. You work in the facility, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, one of your patients is unresponsive in his bed in the facility. That's what you're called for. Okay. Uh, so BSI is seen safe. Safe. <clears throat> um, no obvious trauma. So we're going to go with uh, NOI instead of MOI. Okay. Uh, determine that's uh, just the patient. It's no other patients. Correct. Just that one. Um. Uh, <clears throat> So, and, and this would, I'm assuming we're calling from facility. So I'm going to request EMS and route. Okay. And no well, obvious trauma. So let me change that on the fly. You are the EMS response. <clears throat> okay. So, so no additional needed. EMS resources needed um, since he's the only patient. Um, okay. And because it's NOI, we're going to not assume there's any trauma. So we don't need uh, C spine. <clears throat> um, and we're going to go with um, CAB since he's unresponsive. Okay. All right. Anybody have a different I opinion a on that? Yeah, I got a question. <laughs> um, I do feel like in a situation to where they're like that, you just respond when they're unresponsive. Do you need to try to see if they're like a, a live, awake, alert, enthusiastic type thing, like or well, there, check is, a pulse. there it is. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. So there is one thing you want to check before you make your decision, <laughs> AB or ABC, yeah. if they're unresponsive. If you think back to your CPR training, yeah, that one that one step that we do, and, and that's <clears> everybody <throat> who's taken healthcare provider CPR. If if you if your training has been layperson, then this wasn't there. But if you have an unresponsive patient. Check a pulse. All right. And, and for now, it's, I want you guys to just think if there is a pulse, 
then I don't need to do CPR. When we get way down the line and we start talking about pediatrics, that's going to change. But for now, if it's there, you don't have to do compressions, which means you can do ABC. I go on a tangent. So is it like, because from what I understand, like with pediatrics, like they can have a pulse, but they can still be unresponsive because it's a weak pulse, correct? Or anybody, anybody can have a pulse and still be unresponsive. Gotcha. That you, you, can, you can definitely run it because diabetes can make you unconscious. <laughs> Strokes can make you just yeah. so there's a lot of things that can do that and we'll but we'll we'll get there that's that's in the next module. Um, so Keo you rocked it the size up looked great. Um, the only thing was that one that pulse check for the unresponsive is what threw you off you you went unresponsive straight to see. Uh, yeah. Uh, other than that, though, that was that was it so just remember in the, moving forward i'm glad you did it somebody had to do it so I can I can mention it. Um, if we give you unresponsive, it doesn't necessarily mean automatic CPR. And, and that'll make more sense, especially when we start talking about the different medical issues. But um, if there's no pulse, then, then do CPR. Um, excellent job. All right, let's see. Anyone you want to volunteer or do I get to keep picking? I, I enjoy doing that. I'll volunteer. I'll go. Oh, okay. Ladies first. <laughs> I like that. Let's go ahead, Nikisha. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm already. All right. So you, hmm, I want to give you. Take your time. <laughs> we won't be able to do everybody tonight. So some of y'all are going to get off lucky, but we're going to do this a lot moving forward. Maybe not me, but Chris will be giving y'all stuff. Um, everybody's going to get a kind of So Nikisha, I'm going to give you a, uh, another altered mental status at a grocery store. Okay, could you repeat that again? Yeah, I think somebody was, I can hear myself. Um, you are responding to an altered mental status at a grocery store. Um, um, okay, I will walk in. Uh, is the scene clear? Scene is safe. Is there anything else you want to do with that? Uh, BSI. Yeah, yeah. Put those. Always put those together. In fact, a lot of us when we go through school, we we say them together so much we start to think they're the same step rather than being two different steps. So BSI scene safety, very good. All right, what's next? Um, you said the patient is altered. Um, altered what? Altered mental status. In other words, they're not in their right mind. Okay. Um, I would make sure. Um, are there any more any anybody else that's out of their mind, or is just this one patient? Great question. All right, so you only have one patient. Okay. Um, are they okay? Uh, Do we no. have any weapons or anything like that? No, no weapons. You're seeing is safe. Uh, well, uh, are they responsive? Um, they're looking around aimlessly. Before you move into the primary, though, look back at your size up. Do you see anything you might have missed? You've got BSI, scene safety, and your number of patients. Um, do I need to call EMS? There you go. Okay, so for you, you are EMS. So one patient is taken care of by you. Mm -hmm. If there's more than one, then, yeah, you would need more EMS. So good. We've looked at additional resources. What's next? Um, I guess I would... Um... Uh, to just try to keep the patient calm. Uh, the, the patient don't seem like nothing wrong. They just, you know, they altered. So I, it would be um, ABC, right? Okay. Yeah. So you're, that's where you're going with your mind. Correct. Um, in the spirit of making sure that we hit all these check marks, let's look back at where we were. So you got BSI scene safety. You mm -hmm. got the, a lot of times saying the nature of illness, if you're going to just re not really regurgitate, but if you repeat back to me that I told you they were altered mental status at this particular moment, you don't know what it is. And that's okay, because you haven't gotten that far in your assessment. So their nature of illness is the same as the chief complaint, which is altered mental status. That's what, they, that's what you got called out for. All right, you've determined your number of patients. You got that. You've requested additional resources if necessary, which not necessary because it's just one patient and there's nothing weird going on on the scene. Um, don't forget to consider C-spine. I know it's medical, 
But mm -hmm. again, there's you know, you know, just do that quick look around um, and think did 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 they get hit? A good example of this real world. I got hit from behind at an exit one day up in Buffalo because somebody had a uh, diabetic emergency, blacked out for a second, and then hit me from behind because they were unconscious. Um, so they were now having a medical issue and they were in a car wreck. So they had some trauma involved in that as well. Um, so you're always in a consideration yeah. of mind, even though this is medical, that's, that's why that's there. So make sure that you, you say that. You may, there may not be anything for you to do in 99% of the time, especially in class, I'm not gonna give you trauma on a medical call, but I still want you to tell me that you considered it. All right, just so that I can check that box. All right. Yeah, because I was gonna ask you, was he like, was he you, was he standing up? Was he laying down? Or right. you know? Right. And then, um, and that's okay. So a lot of if even if they fell, if they're altered but still awake, they may try to get up, um, mm. which, puts, which puts their neck at risk if there is trauma. So always consider it. But um, and then we moved into the primary, and you. You worked on Apu, good. Uh, we'll we'll get better at that at, at figuring out where they are in their consciousness as we move forward. And then you told me that you would do ABC, which is perfect. I wanted to make sure that you knew which order you were going to do your primary. So great job for being night one. That's pretty good. You did good. Okay, thank you. All right, who's next? Any I'll questions? Go. Okay, all right, you're next. But any questions before we get started from anybody? Does everybody see how this kind of flows? I want you guys to have right. memorized, not tonight, but um, by the time we do the first boot camp, I want you guys to at least get to where this particular portion of your assessments, you don't have to use the paper for it. All right, the rest of it, yeah, then that has to be expected. But I think by the first boot camp, you guys should be able to get through your size up in your primary. Uh, and the good thing is, is that no matter what skill sheet we show you, medical trauma or BLS, it's the exact same. The changes start happening in the secondary. All right, so for yours, you're responding to a call of five people unconscious in, the, in their living room. Yours, bit, yours okay. is gonna be a little tricky. Okay. Arrive on the scene, BSI, is the scene safe? Okay, so you take your BSI precautions and the scene looks safe. Okay, the scene looks safe. But you have five people uh, just in a room. Right. I have a number of patients, so I'm going to call for additional support okay. uh, through ambulance because I have more than one patient here and it's only just me. Uh, do you feel like you might- I need to determine, go ahead. Do you feel like you might want any other additional resources besides the extra ambulances? Even if even if you don't know what you need, does anything? Yeah, uh, I need uh, dispatch the, the police department, okay, fire department, as well know. as uh, additional, because I don't know, you know, what condition the five patients are in. I don't know if it's uh, trauma. I don't know if it's medical at this point. Okay, yeah, that that not uh, something knocked out five people. That usually winds up being right. environmental, and there's a whole chapter dedicated to that. But yeah, something. That's not something that affected one person, right? That's when it's, when it's a bunch of people like that, I want you to think environmental and, and call for help. When in doubt, call the fire department because they're trained to look for all the different things that could be going on. All right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I got five patients. Uh, I'm about to determine if uh, any of them, what's going on with them. Um, so they're trying all, to assess the patients. They're all sitting around in the living room across the different furniture, uh, unconscious. And the fire department has now shown up and drugged them all into the front yard to you. So you're, you're able to get to them safely. At this point, I'm gonna look at all five patients and try to determine which one I need to, that if they're dead, uh, they're still alive. See, that's what I need to determine first. So the person that might still have a pulse uh, then I'm gonna try to expedite that and also would have an additional help and then, you know, give the number out. We got, you know, one, I don't know if one day, two day, three, All right, so three, three, three have other, a pulse. The other ambulances have shown up. 
and they've all right. you can just you can just pick one patient and run with them. The others are all taken care of. Okay, I got one patient first thing I'm gonna do is uh, determine whether the person uh, has a pulse or not. Uh, okay. So do the, so he does the patient have a pulse? He does not have a pulse. Patient does not have a pulse at this point. I'm going to do CPR. So I'm going to go to uh, uh, CAB. Very good. Very good. Yeah. When it, and when the CAB, remember C is, you can look at C as compressions, not really circulation. Circulation. Uh, right. Right. Even though that's what you're doing. So very good. Um, I had to, had to step it up a little bit for you guys. Y'all are doing good. So, all right. You're going to learn more about scene safety. Uh, particularly environmental issues when we get into some later chapters of module three. Um, so I wasn't going to go too far into it, but I just wanted to see if it triggered anything. If you're like, hey, maybe I don't want to walk right into this living room if something knocked mm -hmm. out five people, right? Um, right? Carbon monoxide, for example. The minute you walk in there, you start breathing the same air as them. And then you could, if that's the problem, you could become a patient as well. Um, so always consider your surroundings. Let me ask you this. And we mm -hmm. can either take a break or I'll let Chris take over or whatever. But um, in regards to uh, seeing safety, because this is one that you'll see, I know that they've they've been putting this in some of the tests. If uh, if you walk into a room and there's a patient there that says he needs your help and there's a gun that looks to be loaded, as best you can tell, uh, sitting on a desk next to him, is your scene safe? No, my scene is not safe. Okay, so now let me ask you this following question, and anybody can answer this. This is not not just I'm not just calling you out. If that's your scene, can you mitigate it, or do you need to retreat to the ambulance? You need to retreat to the ambulance because at the end of the day, it's only two of you guys there right now. You need more people there to help you mitigate the situation. Okay. Does anybody have anything other any other opinions? Yeah, it, it can it could kind of be either or if it's me and uh, the other the other person that's working with me. Uh, it depends on the nature of the call. Uh, I just got a call saying uh, pay a person is in a room with a gun on side them, then that's something different. So I don't really know the nature of the call. You, you, so I don't know if this person is having suicidal thoughts or they're suicidal or they're homicidal. So I don't know. So. Either way, I got to proceed with, with caution. So if it's a person uh, that's having suicidal ideations, then I would try to mitigate um, at the same time. Make, make... So I, well, I guess essentially in this situation, I guess I'm taking it from there's multiple people on the scene and they're, you know, they down and out. And so no, 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 yeah, no, I'm, sorry. I'm talking, I'm talking uh, completely different scenario. This isn't a continuation of your of your call. And that's my, oh, I, I didn't say that. I was, no. So specifically in, in, a, in a blank scene with no, you know, no, um, nothing that we were talking about prior going on. So if you just walked into a room and a patient had okay. called for help and there's a weapon sitting next to him, what I was, what I'm trying to get at is it, when you don't want, if everything else is fine, if they, you know, you'll learn some, some things like when we get to the behavioral emergencies, for example, where this won't apply. But if you can mitigate your scene and make it safe, then you can go ahead and continue your patient care. Just for example, um, a gun sitting on a table is not a threat, right? A person holding right. a gun pointing at you is a threat. Correct. So in this particular case, and this is a scenario that came up to us in, in one of the instructor um, classes that I was taking. If, you, if this is what you see, you walk in, the guy is, let's say he's having a heart attack. Uh, so anything it could be trouble breathing heart attack whatever and he called you he wants you to help him and you show up and he's got a weapon sitting on the table you don't necessarily have to retreat to your truck and and the, the patient go into having more harm a lot of people have weapons in their homes and they have no right. intention of using them on you they just might be there so you can ask him if you can move the weapon to the other side of the room get it out of his reach then now you're seeing the safe. The weapon doesn't matter. It's not going to. It's not going to automatically just randomly fire. You know, right. on, the, on the counter. Right. The so that kind of thing. If it's an unconscious person that is armed, let's say you show up and it's a drug overdose, and when you get there, you find they've got a weapon on them. If you can remove the weapon, that is no longer a threat. So um, I don't want you guys to think that 
an unsafe scene means you can't do anything because you can as long as it's within your ability to do so. And as long as you can do so safely, if the threat to the scene is this rabid dog, then no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna go in there, right? Um, if it's an environmental scene, if it's a, a violent scene and the, the shooter is still there or might still be, or might come back, you know, these are things that you would definitely wanna kind of stay back on. Um, but that's what I was getting at. So scene safety, is not necessarily run and hide behind the ambulance. If, if that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. But if you can fix it, then go ahead and fix it. Um, so there'll be times, and I'm not going to start off with this, but when we get closer to the end of the class, we're going to start putting in, we're going to raise your bar a little bit as to how you're, you know, the difficulty that we put you in. And I might give you a scene that's unsafe, but you may be able to mitigate it. Um, and then also keep in mind that just because your scene is safe at the beginning of your assessment, doesn't mean it's gonna stay safe. All right, real world here, it might be safe when you showed up. Let's say you show up to a stabbing or a shooting and the scene is safe and police are on scene. Like, and by police, I mean, you got one cop on scene and that's it. What are the chances that that shooter may come back to finish the job? So, you know, your scene may not always stay safe. So I want you to keep, when you're doing your side, your um, assessments, and especially in the real world, not just in the nice confines of a classroom, those, those first couple of things, your, your BSI scene safety, that needs to always be on your mind, not just at the beginning. Your gloves could rip. You could go from one patient to another. You don't want to. You don't want to bring one patient's blood to another patient, so you may have to change your gloves. Um, your scene may become unsafe, and then you've got to you got to go back to it. Can I mitigate it, or do I need to retreat? So you guys did great um, for a first night looking at this. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the second half of the assessment yet, but y'all are already kind of figuring out how this is going to go. So the more that we do it, the more that you're going to kind of memorize this and it's going to be like reading, like, I don't know if do people still remember phone numbers these days. I know I, I grew up having to memorize all my friends' phone numbers. So um, you're going to get to where it just, it just flows out of you from BSI all the way to the end of your primary. And then once you reach the end of your primary, that's when you get to start playing. You know, do you want to do vitals first or your history first or whatever? But this part has to be in order. And, and that's pretty much it. That's, that's all I really wanted to do. Chris, do you want to build off of that? Or do you think it's good to let them go and knock out some tests if they've got some remaining? That's it. I mean, I don't have anything else. Um, again, this chapter test will not open up until Thursday night. So I guess you kind of have a, a free one on us. We, we hope changing some things up, made things a little bit more understanding and y'all were, it helped you grasp a few things a little different. Does anybody else have any other questions or concerns or want to talk about anything? No, I, I just would like to say that, you know, I really do appreciate you guys for all that you do, <clears throat> excuse me, all that you do. Um, you guys really dedicate a lot of time to this course. Um, I know everybody else on the call, we dedicate a lot of time. And even though it's like a hybrid course or a hybrid class, like we're doing, we're all doing the best that we can. And, you know, I really do appreciate everybody for being on here and the energy that they give, including you guys, because we all got families. If even if you don't have a family, there's some sort of part of a family that you're a part of that you're missing right now or that you have to tend to while you're doing this right now. And <clears throat> we're all adults and we're all doing the best that we can. And I just appreciate being able to be a part of this. You know what I mean? And I appreciate you guys for working so hard to make sure, you know, EMS keeps going towards the right direction and giving, you know, giving EMS that, you know, more people that are willing to, save lives and do what we got to do as first responders to be the best that we can be. So, you know, that, that's all I had to say. I appreciate it, man. I really do. <laughs> no, I, I deeply do. I, about to say, I think you're going to make Chris cry, man. <laughs> I, uh, no, I, guys, I hope y'all understand. Please know that y'all can reach out to us at any point in time. Um, I've been extremely busy. Um, Today, tomorrow, and the next few days, we're preparing for a massive 21-day shut-in out here. It's 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 a lot. It's we have a lot of things going on. I get involved because we have certain type of. Hey, Chris, I hate to stop you. I hate to stop you, but I'm probably gonna speak for everybody on this one. 
as you told us at the beginning of this class, you we have to expect hiccups. We have to expect all of the random stuff. But yeah. you've already you're overly communicating now because you've already told us you got a lot going on and you're dealing with a lot. And as we all are, but we've all managed to dedicate that time to what we got to yeah. do now. And it's done. And we did it. And Chris, no more over explaining, dude. Bruh, you like, we're all like, bruh, you doing your thing. You making it happen where you're at. And you making it happen in this class. We got it. Just we picking up what you putting down. Rob, we picking up what you putting down too. And we got to all realize that it's a time and a place. This is a time and a place. You don't have to, I, I, I'm going to speak for everybody and say, you don't have to always explain. I got you, bro. We ready. Let us know what we got to do when we got to do and we're going to do it. Period. Well, good note. Well, look, Rob, you got anything to add? Uh, no, just, you know, you guys have a couple of outstanding tests that we got to catch up from module one. Um, they're really affecting a lot of your grades. Some of you, I know that it's not been your fault, tech issues, uh, two of y'all, because your employers are putting you through the class. You couldn't start with us until you got through the uh, hiring process. Like, I get that. Um, so we're going to give you guys the opportunity to catch up. You know what you have to do, what you have to submit to get access to retaking a test. But um, just moving forward, try to keep up with that. Remember, we gauge your progress from those tests. If you're three tests back, we have to assume that you're three chapters back and that we, we can't have that, especially when we get butted up against the end of a module. Everybody's got to start a module at the same time. So that's that's really it. Um, every, you know, I, I don't want to go too far into it, but everybody, a lot of people are just a couple of tests back. So um, get with Chris, sub, make your submissions, get them unlocked, get them done. That way your averages are back where they need to be. Need to be. All right, folks, and to wrap everything up, uh, y'all need this, and then there it is in the chat group. Um, that is your class code in red tonight. Not the equal sign, but the LVE143. I just love y'all guys so much. So look, thank you, put in for your class code so you can get attendance, and class will be the rest of the slides on Thursday night. I hope y'all have a fantastic night. Thank y'all for coming around, and I hope we can help y'all out. Later. Hello, Mr. Chris. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Um, I have one.